Happy Monday. Welcome back. I did this instead of killing myself. Stand-up comedy and lifestyle podcast based in Greenville, South Carolina, where we interview local stand-up comedians and other guests um, about comedy, about life, advice, everything and anything in between. Um, it is the week of August 23rd, 2021. It's a little crazy in the world today. Hope you guys are staying sane. Uh, Mondays are normally rough, but um, we got a lot of craziness between like Afghanistan and uh, Australia and people who want to get vaccinated, people who don't. And I don't know where you live, but hopefully you're staying safe and um, not letting the crazy news stuff get to you. But um, but yeah, good news is this podcast is not really about stuff like that most of the time. <laughs> and um, and it is a great week of comedy, and, and we do have a great guest today. My guest today is Brad Deaton. Uh, Brad is a uh, native, uh, I guess Carolinian. He's from North Carolina. He drives in to uh, do comedy here in Greenville. That's where I met him. He's a multi-talented guest. He has written a children's book. Um, he is also an avid TikToker, musician, DJ, uh, a really prolific, creative, hilarious guy. I only knew about his stand-up until you know I got to know him a little bit better. Um, he's also a uh, husband and father. So in our interview today, I picked his brain about that because I need to figure all that stuff out myself. Um, and yeah, we had a great conversation. I think it went a little over an hour and a half uh, or around around there. So hope you have time to relax and enjoy our conversation. Um, before we get into that, here's what's going on this week in local comedy. Um, we'll start with the normal slate of open mics uh, tonight, uh, Coffee Underground, 7 o'clock. Um, that's hosted by No Expectations Comedy and Craig Holcomb. Immediately following that at 8 o'clock, Dante Anderson hosts All Jokes Aside. That's at Habib's Mediterranean Restaurant on Haywood Road. Um, so there's 8 o'clock, no cover charge for that. Um, Doolittles in Anderson on Tuesday night, um, hosted by Robin Scott. Um, that mic starts at 7 o'clock. Um, there will be a tip jar, but no cover there. Our feature comedian there this week is Shelly Belly. Um, Wednesday at the Radio Room. This is the open mic hosted by Adam Schulte. I believe this week, though, Queen Momo is hosting. And it's going to be the ladies' open mic. So I encourage all ladies to come out. If you're a female stand-up comedian, that'll be your night to be featured. Um, guys still come out and support. I think uh, there's a chance there may be open mic slots for the guys. I don't want to speak for Momo, but there, there may be as well. Also on Wednesday, the Disclaimer Stand-Up Lounge. Um, this is up in Asheville. So if you want to make a drive up to Asheville, it's at 8 o'clock. Um, it's at 31 Patton Ave in Asheville. Um, that's on Wednesday. And then on Thursday night, uh, the Jokes Out Loud open mic um, hosted by Brandon Rainwater. Uh, that's the last one of the month and a very fun stage, very fun crowd. Uh, make sure you check that out as well. It's a $10 cover. Um, starts at eight o'clock. All right. That's it for local comedy. Hope you guys have a great week and here's the interview. All right, Brad, welcome to my apartment. Our guest today, Brad Deaton. I'm pronouncing that right, right? Yes, you are. Yeah. Brad Deaton. Very funny guy from North Carolina? Uh, South Carolina. South Carolina. It's a bad interview prep. It's, I'm coming it's back from same. vacation. It's, it's, it's just like 30 minutes. So you're, you're close enough. Okay. I know you I know you travel it a little bit. Yeah. I was going to say Brad is one of the funniest guys ever until a couple minutes ago. He made a Big Bang Theory reference. <laughs> Dude. Now you got I, something against me. How do you not yeah. like the Big Bang Theory? He's because it lovable. sucks. It sucks. Actually, no, that's better. Why Why do you like the Big Bang Theory? I, you know, it, I can't say Big Bang Theory is not. I hear people say that Big Bang Theory is like the greatest show ever and everything like that. I could never say that. It's one of those that you could put in the background, on in the background, and just kind of okay. keep doing. Kind of like comfort and, food for your brain. Sort yeah, of. exactly. But yeah. I, I do have a soft spot. I watched it all the way through. I don't know. It's kind of funny. It's kind of who corny. do you like on? Okay, so as much as I hate it, I do actually know. Like Penny and, and Sheldon, right? And, yeah. the, and yeah. Leonard, and you have Raj okay. and Howard. 
Yeah. Uh, it, my favorite's got to be Sheldon just because he kind of makes the show. He's so annoying. You want to strangle him. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I kind of feel like people probably feel that about me. So I kind of. <laughs> just so annoying that they want to strangle. So I, I never, wanted, relate, to, I never I wanted to strangle you. I actually wouldn't Give compare you to Sheldon either because Sheldon's like ultra <laughs> nerd. You're like, I don't know what I would describe you as. I would describe you as kind of like uh, inappropriate hillbilly southern. <laughs> I don't mean that in a ne- <laughs> I don't mean that in a negative. What's no, funny? I love it. You're endearing and likable. Like what I tell you, I say, like you do great. Like you're hilarious, and you'll just be smiling and having this bubbly disposition, and then your material <laughs> will go edgy as hell, and the audience can't help but go with you. So, and I do kind of like that. I do kind of like that. I come off like, and you know, come off like this. Kind of, I don't know, southern, a southern gentleman kind of thing, and then yeah. I hit him with like very dark yeah. humor. Yeah, um, it's kind of something I try to aim for. The southern accent thing is kind of funny because I, for the longest time, didn't know I had a southern accent. Like you, when you, you, did, you didn't know? No, nobody told me. <laughs> you know, you you grow up around all the hillbillies. You don't realize you're one. I was just looking at these people being like, God, I'm around all these like rednecks. So yeah, I didn't realize that. Until I went like somewhere north, right? And somebody was like, "Jesus, you have the biggest southern yeah. accent I've ever heard." And I was like, "What? I yeah, southern accent?" See, see, I'm from Michigan, so I notice it right away, <laughs> and in a good way, man. There's some people thought. that have southern accents that are not that flattering, but I think you know, I think it suits you, like everything. Oh well, thank you. Yeah. I, I was, uh, I was, where was I? I was somewhere in the south, but I was like at Rock Hill. And I had like a mohawk. I was a punk back in the day. I had mohawk, okay. spike belt, you know, ripped jeans. And I'm in this a bicycle shop. Okay. A friend of mine knew the owner and we're in there. And I'm not saying a word. I'm just kind of walking around. This girl comes in and she's from New Jersey. And she starts talking and asking where we were from. And I hadn't said a word. My friend's kind of explaining, you know, we're from Wahala. And she says, is that near Salem? Which is like Salem. It's really hick down near us. She pronounced and, it like that? From yeah, New, she was from like, New Jersey? Salem. Did she and have an accent or was she just making fun of she that? She had an accent. She had an accent. Oh, from New she Jersey. She said solemn for some reason. And then she said, I went through there one time and I asked this guy for directions and he said, back the way you came. <laughs> and she said, them bunch of hillbillies, rednecks. And I thought it was so, and my friend looked at me and said, don't say a word. Yeah. And I said, I won't. She said, you're one of them. And I was like, no, I promise I'm a good one. <laughs> if she's pronouncing Salem solemn, it sounds like she's one of them too. I don't, I get, I don't know. I don't know exactly where she got that pronunciation but it yeah was funny. that's weird so do you have like a thing against yankees no no well i don't know if you could explain it to me there's some kind of thing there is and there i don't understand i think that. there might be a difference between like how people in the south view like midwesterners versus you know people from like new york new jersey like see my best friend's from connecticut so okay. I give him shit all the time. Like I call him Yankee and stuff, which yeah. is funny as hell because he's from Connecticut yeah. and he hunts and fishes and I don't okay. <laughs> like he's more of a redneck. It'd than normally I am. be the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but the funny thing is when they came down here, his father was like, took over as a manager for a plant. That's why they moved down here. Okay. And these two guys walked up to him. They said, uh, you know, uh, Yankee, you know what happens down here? Don't you ever seen deliverance? And they started laughing. And he said, yeah, I remember all I remember about it is that the Yankee killed the redneck. <laughs> and both of them just kind of stopped. <laughs> oh there, my there is definitely, I always heard jokes like growing up. But I think that comes from anything. What Anytime, is the stereotype like, though? What are the stereotypes? I, I don't know. I think it's like stuck up stuck like, up i think, think you're better than, than yeah, the southern I think way that's okay the stereotype yeah that this is helpful for me because it's like what we're up against you know if you, <laughs> that douchebag white guy doesn't talk like us Let's see. <laughs> no. well, i don't trust him and then they'll ask you to go back where you came that's... right or they'll say bless your heart that's the thing i get a lot it's like bless you. i don't even know what that meant for like the first year i was you didn't no. realize you didn't realize oh, pretty pretty much pretty... fuck you they're like... really nice yeah I didn't realize they're like, yeah, this guy is basically retarded. Uh, oh my god! But Southern people have the they they have the nicest way to yeah. say the most terrible shit. Mm-hmm. I, so there's this woman at work one time, and this sweet old lady, uh-huh. and I'd known her, I'd seen her around, had worked real close with her, but she always called me darling. Right. She said, "You're such a sweetheart, darling." Yeah. And then I had to work close with her one day, and like she was. On this machine I was working on, I'm kind of a mechanic, like I'm a technician. Uh-huh. Machines, and anyway, she we get to talking. She's just like, we were working so much overtime. I wish we'd stop. 
And I said, yeah, me too. And she said, I just wish I could go to church more. <laughs> okay. Said, yeah, you know, I'm, I hope that happens for you. She wishes she could? What, yeah. did you work on Sunday? Yeah. Oh, that, wow. That was the thing at the time. We had so much overtime. I got you. And then she, I, I said, you know, I hope that happens for you. And then she kind of stopped and she goes, uh, you should come to my church. And I was like, well, that's very sweet for the offer. I'll consider that. Then there was another like lull in the conversation. Yeah. And she goes, are you a believer uh-huh. and like i'm just like oh this is gonna be an awkward <laughs> conversation so i'm like stuttering like i'm like well i you know i believe in something i don't believe in you know what yeah. conventional things you know i do believe something's up and i'm just just dumb or just failing yeah, just yeah. diving and, and finally what she i said? just said i'm not i'm not a christian oh I, oh and dude she look, oh man i know that she looked me dead in the eyes and she said well you know it's like my preacher always says you either go to heaven or the other place. And I was like, did you just fucking tell me I was going to hell? <laughs> it was the nicest way I've ever been told that I was going to hell. It was yeah. very, very sweet. That's, <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, dude. That's tough, man. That's tough. What were you raised? Were you raised Christian or yeah. strict Baptist or what? Like, ba- what were- well, Baptist, not strict Baptist. My parents were always kind of, I mean, they never forced anything on us. We went, I went to church with my grandparents. Um, which is funny because I remember like my grandpa taking me to church. I was talking to my dad the other day and he was like, he hated church. Yeah. And I was like, most really? people do. And I didn't re- like, I never, if you're I really honest, dude, it. most people do not. Most people think church is boring, especially kids or dads. I would say. Yeah. And this, and we have, I, I never thought, like I said, like the whole thing about like not realizing I had a Southern accent. Yeah. There's a lot of things. Cause I, I never really left the South that much. Yeah. I, I've been North like a couple of times. I've went to travel a little bit, but, for the longest time, this is all I knew. So there was yeah. some things that like somebody from somewhere else would come here and this light bulb would hit. Sure. And there was these two girls Opened your from world England up. that we were showing around. Okay. And they looked out the window of the car. We were driving down the street and they said, can I ask you something? I said, what? She said, what the fuck is up with all the churches? Yeah. And I was like, what do you mean? She's yeah. like, you have one on every street corner, like rival yeah. gangs or something. I never thought about that. Yeah. You know, David up. Zasloff had the same, you know, the, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, guy from LA moved yeah, here. He's awesome. He makes a joke about it that there's churches on every block, and that was one of the things he noticed. It's not the same in LA, so yeah, yeah. very interesting. Yeah, I was. I mean, I went to church. I got baptized. My mom said something the other day because I said uh, I was talking about something, and she said you were baptized, and I said I know. And she said the water started to boil when they dumped you under. And I was like, that is a good joke. And I'm gonna use it. Yeah, <laughs> have you used that on stage? No, yet? she told it to me just other day. I said, did you come up with that? And she was like, yeah. I was like, I hope you know I'm gonna steal that from you. Yeah, <laughs> because that's awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, dude, religion's interesting, man. I was, uh, I was brought up in a pretty, uh, conservative, uh, Christian upbringing. And I still am a Christian, but I'd say that's doing comedy, like has, uh, brought those two things in conflict a little bit. Mm. Um, cause creativity is, is very different from, uh, dogma and not that Christian is dogma mm. per se, but it could be interpreted that way. Yeah. Like it's very do this or you're going to hell. Like you said. Yeah. Whereas creativity is more about like, you know, opening to other things. And, and, uh, I, I found there's like a conflict between creativity and, uh, and, and dogma or, um, and I've had to wrestle with that since I've tried to be creative. So because you want to open your mind to new ideas, but a strong belief in something kind of throttles that. I mean, that's, that's why yeah. religion is a very, and my dad always said, uh, there's two things you don't talk about with other people and that's religion and politics politics. right and it's because people believe they feel so strongly about those those issues right so if you sit there and have a conversation with someone about religion especially in the south i found that nine times out of ten it's not a conversation right it's either them kind of going over a script of what they believe or it's them getting very upset that your ideals kind of undermine theirs. Yeah. Almost like you're trying to say something bad about their religion by having other beliefs and being vocal. It's, it's right. a very weird and yeah. touchy stuff. It's identical to politics, oh, like uh, you yeah. said, because if nowadays everybody's mind is already made up and it's like they're just waiting for you to say something that signals which side you're on. And then they're like, okay, I can either dismiss you or I can hug you. But there's very little discourse happening. Oh, absolutely. And I feel like creati- creativity is very... 
and I, I had this conflict too of like some of what I want to talk about is 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 edgier and and mm. you know it pokes fun at things and not exactly appropriate for what would be said in the church and yeah. I, I worry about that as like how it's perceived but well and you can't uh, that kind of comes back to me I mean this is my opinion but like life's too short I, I stopped giving a shit what people thought about what I said a long time ago I mean that's that's a good place to get to you know and uh, and, and I still I say that but of course I do I'm the kind of person that I really if somebody says something I could say that that sentiment to you by go home I'm like I can't right. believe they said that shit to me like yeah <laughs> well if you can get out of the weeds with like the technical stuff of what's right or wrong like of the words. I mean, mm. if you could like you rise above what you're really trying to do in comedy, I mean, the well, motivation is to make someone laugh, to provide joy to somebody else. Well, you know, kind of the- so it's it's out of love. The intention never be, I'm going score straight. That's not even comedy. Then you're out of, then you're like propaganda sort of. Oh, well, it's not so malicious. And right. that's a funny thing. That's where the fine line is. I think every comic struggles with is how offensive is this and how funny is it going to be right because i honestly am of the mindset that if something is really really funny i don't give a shit how offensive it is yeah me you too. know like me anthony too. jesnick i think some of his jokes are so absurdly right. offensive mm-hmm. but that's the point he is right. he is aiming for that he's aiming for that bullseye he didn't accidentally say this right he, and, and the audience for. knows and understands it's not real. Otherwise, they wouldn't laugh. Yeah, and it's a clever setup. I yeah. mean, it's a very funny yeah. joke. You but, wouldn't laugh at a real serial killer. No. Most it, likely. And yeah. I've heard other comedians fail at doing that. I've yeah. heard comedians try to do it, and you have to. I've failed at it. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My first, yeah. Tried a lot of offensive stuff. So, uh, well, absolutely. But there's got to be that. I mean, that comes down to, like, you even talk about, like, some of the comedians that are, you know, kind of under fire now. I mean, you yeah. for a comedian to be, Jerry Seinfeld said the other day that he said something in an interview, it might have been a while ago, but he said comedy is dead because people are getting so offended, which I don't think comedy is dead. I do think that there is, comedians are having a harder time taking risk yeah. because there has to be a little bit of safety in that. I can't just yeah. go out tomorrow. Like if I went to comedy club tonight, comedy yeah. zone, somebody yeah. got me on video and I said something super offensive and it went viral and I lose my job and I lose everything. Yeah. You know, I mean, the only thing that is a savior to that nowadays is there are people on the other side of that fighting for these people. It's, sure. You know? Yeah. So very, I don't know if comedy's dead, but it is kind of interesting because comedy is not just what the comedians are trying. It's, it's how the audience receives it. So it's kind of like where the culture's at. Mm. So if the audience members are in a place where they don't feel like they can laugh anymore at things, then, then comedy is kind of dying because yeah. it's like, you, you know, you got to soften the audience and you know, if, if it gets harder and that, that limits what your topics are to talk about, then comedy is kind of in a bad place. But I think a lot of people are resistant to the, the cancel culture. Yeah. Well, and like what you said the other day about you, you, you just said a couple minutes ago about the other day you did that joke you were talking about. Yeah. yeah. It was offensive and it got good laughs. Yeah. And then you did it somewhere else. You did it exactly the same <laughs> way and it bombed. And it's yeah. funny the different audiences you come in contact with. I've done jokes that I didn't think that were that funny. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a median into something else and hit really hard. Yeah. And then, I, you know, some places for some reason. And I've done jokes that hit a thousand times and I did it somewhere and it's just crickets. Yeah. It's like I walked into a funeral and squatted on the coffin. It's just Sp- not. Sp- <laughs> nobody's having a good time. Speaking of funerals. uh <laughs> I don't want to burn any of your jokes. No, no, no. I'm good with that. You're, you're good talking prepared. about it. Yes, I love that. Well, I my joke. favorite joke, I remember I met you at Radio Room on a Wednesday, uh, and we were talking before the show, and you were like, you know, we talked to a lot of comics and stuff, but yeah. like, I love to, I love talking to you because you were super accessible. Like, you weren't like all like, you know, buttoned up, like well, not wanting you. to talk. And uh, you said something about that funeral joke and uh, the boner. Yeah. Has that joke ever not worked? Um, oh God, uh, the other night I did it and, uh, it got the, it got the reaction it should have, but didn't get as many laughs. Do you want to tell the joke real quick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So I'm a very empathetic person. Uh, I feel everything and also I'm very easy to read and that makes certain situations very awkward for me because I feel everything and people know exactly how I'm feeling. And that's why I hate funerals because I just can't stand 
being in this room full of sad people standing next to that coffin trying to hide my boner. <laughs> It's such a, it's such a, you and I told you that night that I met you. I said we were talking about offensive jokes, and the reason I told it to you is I said there's one joke I can't bring myself to say because it's it's just so stupid. I don't know if I'll get a laugh. I told it to you, and you said you have to do that on stage. Yeah. So I went with it. I did it next time, and it killed. Yeah. It was a very Hell yeah. it got a very good reaction. The reason I like that joke too is I forgot how long the setup was, and uh, you know. So, like I've been experimenting a little more with shorter jokes to try and get laughs per minute more and, and to have a tighter set. But I like the ones that have that big build up because the, the misdirect is so hard. Oh, thank you. That like it it hits harder. You know, Norm yeah. Macdonald has jokes like that. He's probably one of my oh favorite my comedians. God. But he'll have a setup that's like five minutes long, and then the punchline just levels you and uh oh i know and the punchline is usually like the corniest thing in yeah. the world but he sets it up for he gives backstories to the side characters and yeah. families to like he does this weird i watched him on a um because i every once in a while i'll come across his comedy and watch something with him on a talk show or something where mm -hmm. he's telling one of these jokes it's just hilarious to yeah. see him set it up and it's so ballsy to be able to do that whole like a like long, long setup because you've put it is. so much effort into it, right? Yeah, you have to have so much confidence. I don't to do that to to, to linger in silence for that long. See, for that joke, it's not confidence for me. I, and really? this sounds kind of cocky. It's not cocky. It's um. It's, You're talking about the funeral a, joke. It's a genuine thing. Like when I was growing up, I always. I mean, I think every comic kind of leans toward this. Is kind of how they got started. Is a coping mechanism. I mean, yeah. dealing with weird situations and things that made me uncomfortable or sad stuff, I always made very dark jokes. Right. And um, that's kind of one of those things where I was, that joke is just me being genuine. I'm an empathetic person. It's all very true. Yeah. At the end, you it's me. That. Yes. At the end, it's me cushioning the fall of being that open to you. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's me being very open, and then I'm just like, ah, right, now I got to make it funny yeah. so I don't feel awkward about being that open with that's you or very, that open that's with That's very audience. insightful. Yeah. And um, the first messed up joke I can remember I ever wrote, I was 11. Yeah. And my, oh my God, my grandpa died. And uh, you were writing jokes at 11? The, well, this is, this is, I mean, well, yeah. I that's mean, incredible. To yeah, an go extent, ahead. I mean, um, go ahead. Well, on. I'll tell you the context of how this happened. And it's the way I coped with it. My grandpa died. I was very close to him. I loved him very much. Um, his funeral was on my birthday. That's a rough thing to deal with. My yeah. 11th birthday was his funeral. And uh, I came to school, and my elementary school teacher asked me, how was your birthday? And I said, oh, I spent it at my grandpa's funeral. And I just watched her squirm. I mean, even at that age, I knew yeah. what I was doing. Yeah. And I watched her squirm, and then I said, yeah, the awkward, the worst part is they served my birthday cake on his coffee. <laughs> and I watched her just frantic, right? To me, but that's the way I dealt with it. Like this sick joke. I was 11 years old. And I'll never forget that because I feel like that was the first joke like I wrote. That's and hilarious. Like, yeah. Uh, like, Have you ever told I, that on stage? No. No. I have not. And, and that's kind of the thing, too. I, I'm trying to get to that place. I think the way I convinced myself to get on stage was so much like, well, genuine. There's genuine stuff in my act, but a lot of it is like displacement. Like I is it's very, you know what I mean. Like I haven't got up there and told a genuine story yet. Yeah. Like I have. I actually I can't. Say what do you that. mean I displacement? Feel, like getting up there and, and having everything mapped out to the point to where I, I know where my punches are and. I've got the joke so manufactured. Some of it is, most of it's fake stuff yeah. that didn't happen. I haven't got up there and been able to like, I don't know some of the stuff. And I think it's been more subconscious because when I went back and looked at all the jokes I wrote or all the jokes I've done on stage, because I've got a ton of jokes I wrote. All the ones I haven't done on stage have been like the real stories, like really long, actual like stories from my life. Yeah. And I just haven't, I, and it's not even like I purposely said I'm not going to do that. It's every time I go to do that joke, I go, no, nah, I'm going to do this one instead. Sure. It's kind of like I keep out. it back because, yeah, it's a cheap out. It is. Yeah. And I'm trying to work up to that, like yeah. being able to go up there and tell a real story and just 
hope that the audience connects with it so yeah. much that they do find the little nuances funny. Yeah, and just let go of the expectation of laughter or anything and yes. just be real. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I think Doolittle's is a great place to try that. Yeah. Uh. Uh, because Doolittle's Robin gives us extra time. You get eight to ten minutes, yeah. even. I did ten the other day, and uh, you know that's a pretty safe spot to to open up a little bit. I do love that room. Yeah, I really yeah. like that room. It's good. So they got Shout out Robin room. Scott. It's awesome. Yeah, awesome. Um, dude, that's great. So I wanted to says, it seems like you've been doing stand up a long time, but I don't think it has been. Like, how long had have you been doing it? So I started, I think it was November 2019 was my first set. Okay. I've only been on stage, I think now it's 16 times. That's to, unbelievable. Thank, that's unbelievable based on how good you. you are. Just saying. Do I appreciate that no, so much. No, but um, that's great. So, and I, I was really glad to have you because, like, I don't know you that well yet. But, like, the more I, like, go down the rabbit hole of Brad D and I'm like, dude, this dude is absolutely hilarious. And you're pretty prolific creatively. Like, you do a lot of stuff. So, that? like, what was your first thing you did creatively? Because you were in a band, yeah. right? You've illustrated a, a short story. Yes, yes. And uh, you also are avid on TikTok. Your TikTok is freaking hilarious. Oh, thank you. So, what was your first creative? Ooh, uh... I don't know. Because it was much before 2019, I'm sure. Oh, yes. Very right. much so. Um, but it, it's so weird. I'm I'm very ADD. And, and I'm, I'm very <laughs> like, I have so many hobbies. And I've kind of always been that way. I, and, and a big thing for me is like, I get excited about something. I'd start doing something. And then I would kind of leave it and go. The one thing I never left was guitar. I started playing guitar when I was in seventh grade. Okay. And uh, but my dad played. And my mm -hmm. brother-in-law also. And I remember, like, the day I looked at my dad and I was like, what do I have to do for you to teach me to play guitar? And he said, ask that question. And that was Heck it. Yeah. I started learning everything like that. And I, and first so he wasn't going to push you into it. He was going to wait for you to have an interest. And that That's was good. exactly it. I a lot of kids quit, cool quit instruments, I think, because they're like, oh, you got to play the clarinet, honey. You got to play the piano. And then it becomes <laughs> something they don't love. But you wanted to do it. Yeah. What's so funny is uh, – in sixth grade, I played an instrument before I played guitar, and it was the trombone. Uh -huh. And I remember, like, I, you know, my parents didn't have a lot of money, uh -huh. so they had, they had to do the rental program. Yeah, yeah. But I they waited those. too long, and all these other kids got these nice trombones they rented, and I had one that the case was falling apart, metal was sticking out of the case, yeah. and like fabric was falling off and rotten wood, and that was the case. The How long did you stick? Was Huh? How long did you stick with that? Oh no! Since uh, as long as I had to, right. sixth grade, I didn't. I never learned the trombone. Yeah. I faked it because all you got to do is just do the arm <laughs> movements. I just watched everybody Dude, else. I never actually yeah. played the trombone. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's kind of. I don't know. It's funny, but um, I don't know. I always loved, like even before, like like I said, I played guitar and to go through all that, like I. I loved music. The first song I actually played was a Johnny Cash song. Oh, it was his yeah. rendition of Hurt was the first song okay. I ever learned to play. I yeah. And um, then when I was like 16, I joined a punk rock band. I started kind of finding – because when you And you up, had the Mohawk at that point? Not at that point. I got my Mohawk when I was 19. Okay. And um, when I was like 16, I was finally like around – I guess I was around like – 14 i started to find what i liked as far as music because uh -huh. growing up in the south listening to the radio it was all country like, that was mostly what i listened to and when i was like probably like 10 i heard my first rock song it was uh the doors break on through the other hell song. yeah and it just like it just shattered my world right Dude, I was like, this the exists? doors unreal Man, it, the whole album that I listened to, what it was on was the Forrest Gump, uh, Forrest Gump soundtrack. Okay. My brother-in-law was playing it in his Mustang with the bass bumping. Yeah. Back, and it just, like, changed my world. Yeah. And um, I just remember, like, and from there, like, I started discovering new music. And then, like, I watched American Pie 2, and that got me into punk rock. Okay. Some yeah. For the first time. Yeah. Like, yeah. And then by 16, I was in a little punk rock band playing, like, Green Day and stuff. Yeah. And, uh I don't know. I loved it. I loved music, and I always mm. tried to like dabble in other stuff. Um, as far as comedy, uh, I know that we were talking about like how long I've been doing it and how long I've been wanting to do it and stuff like that. I, and like I said, I started when I was like I was right before I turned thirty. I think I, or I was thirty. Mm -hmm. But um, was there something about that birthday that made you realize like, hey, if I'm going to do it, well, it did was, you feel old? It was honestly like 
so to like take it way back, like ever since I was little, like I remember like listening to Jeff Foxworthy, right? Dude, yeah. Like, and that was like, it was so funny. I love Jeff Foxworthy. You, you, yeah, now that you say Jeff Foxworthy, I get a lot of that from you. Yeah. And, and it, it might be like, the accent actually, too. Actually, Ryan Rubin, here, dude, or when I got off stage the other night, said, uh, hey, everybody put your hands together for Jeff Foxworthy's retarded cousin. <laughs> and I was like, you mother. It was a good one. Was yeah. Good one. But, um. Especially since I like started off that set by shitting on somebody's set. Like I, I got up there. I didn't. You. I, I don't think you were there that night. No. I got up there and there was a kid and he. Um. I don't know. I just like he looked like Michael Sarah, and so oh, was this a Doolittle's last week? Co- no, it was a couple weeks ago. A couple weeks ago, okay. and uh, he looked like Michael Sarah. And I was so happy about like I was gonna go up there and tease him about looking like Michael Sarah. Yeah. And Ryan Rubin was hosting, and he, as he was introducing him, said it. And I was like, damn it. Yeah. So I went on after the guy. The first thing I said, I didn't even mean to go so savage. I kind of felt bad about it. But the joke I said was, um, damn it, Ryan. I, I had a whole thing about him looking like Michael Sarah, and you beat me to it. I'll never forgive you. Yeah. I said, but his set was bad. It was super bad. And then I just, <laughs> yeah, I just went into my Did material. people laugh? Yeah, everybody. Oh, it, that good. was the best laugh I got. I love that. It, super bad. Uh, that's that's one of the best movies <laughs> oh ever. God, yeah. I was curious to see if the whole room laughs because of super it bad. Was. It's, it's it was. because that movie's getting a little old, so that, I'm glad that reference hit. And he, liked it. he laughed, too. If he hadn't left, I would have felt bad. Yeah. But he laughed, too, and I was like, okay, I can't. Yeah, because it's not like you were – I mean, even if his set was bad like the yeah. fact that you're saying super bad as the pun is like you oh, know yeah. you didn't mean it as hard as <laughs> but uh, yeah you, i listened to like jeff foxworthy and then like growing up like finally like i remember the i, I used to like one well, of my friends brought me this up this uh, uh, uh this up the other day like i used to like do the scene from the mask like okay. Anytime people would get which, together, which scene? The scene where he's dying, and he stumbles over. I would just, whenever <laughs> somebody would come to my house, apparently, I would do that down the hallway and then fall <laughs> in their arms. Wait, do it, do it. What is he me, saying? Again? Hold me at him. <laughs> to hold you, other, I love him. <laughs> Don't try to give him a hug this Christmas. And <laughs> cough in their face. And so apparently, I did this all the time. It's still to this day, like when I see my friend, he's like, do the math scene. And I was like, I'm 30. Oh, <laughs> my like, God. I don't remember all of it. But um, yes, yeah, so I always loved it. And I, we actually found a tape of me when I was like 14, I guess, doing stand up. Like, mm. I had written out a stand up set. And like, it was after. When you were 14? I, yeah. And wow. I like wrote out a stand up set. And it was so bad. The only joke I remember is a joke about a guy going through the woods, and his name is Bob White. So he gets really pissed off at the birds because they keep going, Bob, what? Bob, what? Like, <laughs> what? I don't know. It's a stupid fucking, like, there's certain birds that make that sound. I oh. guess that's what I was going off of. But I was, like, 14. And, like, that's what right around when I found, like, good comedy. Like uh-huh. I said, I, had, I and I'm not saying Jeff Foxworthy is not good comedy, but, like, that's what I listened to, you know, by proxy. It was around me, so I listened mm-hmm. to it. And I remember, like, being in seventh grade and going to my friend's house. And um, him saying, I got I got these tapes you'll have to hear. And bring out a CD player. Like, we're camping in the front yard, and he gets an extension cord. And he, first thing he plays is Bill Cosby. Hell, yeah. And it's funny as fuck. Yeah. And then it's George Carlin. <laughs> and oh, it, cha- and it changed my life. Like, listen, yeah. George Carlin, seven, you know, seven words you can't say on TV or radio yeah. or whatever. And it was so funny. And then I started, like, even from there, like, it was like, Started listening to like even what's his name the one of the blue collar comedy guys uh, White, oh, Ron White yeah Ron White and then Larry the Cable Guy and there's like, a couple others yeah and we found like a tape of me doing stand up and you could tell I was trying to be Ron White so I was oh, just yeah. being super grotesque like a fifteen year old just saying bowels and cock and like, <laughs> just like it's not a good scene who were you doing like, stand up in front of what was the setting just I was Your sitting friends? in my bedroom with a tape player just hitting oh record okay and, like, so you were by yourself by myself and then. Like I said, the other day, my parents were, my mom was going through something. Oh, it was a video. She found a videotape. Like they're yeah. going through old tapes on the camera. Yeah. Or in this old camera we had. Yeah. And there was a, me. It was so cringy. Yeah. And my sister was like, I will post it if you ever piss me off. And I was like, oh, that's not right. Like, <laughs> oh, dude, that's cool, though. But, that's um, cool. Yeah, I mean, I loved it. And then, mu- like I said, music, I did that. And, uh, Do you wish you would have started doing stand-up at 14? And, and like, it. actually, I mean, like, I know you usually ask people, like, what your biggest regret is. And yeah, I, do I do have one we can talk about later. But one of the regrets that came to my mind when I think about that question is that I didn't start earlier. Like, I kept saying all the way through my 20s, even when I was, like, 
like in my teens, I said, I'm going to do stand up one day. Like I'm going to get up there and I'm going to do it. And I just, I just never, it was, it was procrastination. It's almost that thing about like getting excited about it. Cause I'm able to say it without any of the, any of the actual, any of the risk or consequences. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I got to say one day I'm going to get on that stage. I'm going to do stand up. And that made you feel good. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, and it's a whole other animal to do it. Exactly. Totally. And in 2019, like my dad had a heart attack. He's okay now, but he had a massive heart attack. And uh, my mom was going through health issues, and I went through like a big period with depression. And like I was, I mean, it's just a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. And my wife was struggling with anxiety. And, I, you know, trying to learn how to be a father too. And uh, I don't know, it just kind of, one day, I mean, me and my friends were kind of talking. We Like we always did bullshit. We were joking around. And one I was like, we should all do stand-up one day. And, you know, and I just, it kind of clicked. When I got home, that played over my mind over and over again. I was like, why the fuck have I not tried that yet? Yeah. I've always wanted to do this. Something I've always wanted to do. One day, you know, one day I'm going to be in a box in the ground forever. Yeah. So why not? Why am I waiting? I'm yeah. 30 years old. Yeah. So I sat there and called my buddy up. And I was like, hey, you know, we was talking about that. I was like, I set the date. I'm going there on this date. If you want to come with me, you can. If you don't, that's cool too. And all my friends showed up. And I got on stage and did three minutes and actually didn't bomb. Like I was that's so, great. so, cause everybody I'm not surprised that that did. Yeah. I got up there and like got some good laughs and it just like, I remember getting off stage and Brandon Rainwater, like coming he was up, here at comedy zone. Yeah. It was first time. And, uh, when I, he sat there and said, uh, before I was leaving, he, I was walking by him and he kind of grabbed me by the shoulder and he was like, come back. He was yeah. like, do it again. And I was like, I will. I'll be back. It's so great when guys like that do that. You know, yeah, it made me feel good. A little you know, bit made of me feel encouragement. Like, I did so like, it made me feel like maybe I was a little, or had a little bit of potential or something, yeah, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, he actually had mistaken me for another comedian. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's so fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, yeah, no. And I started, and then uh, I started getting into it. And trying to get out. And that's kind of a hard thing, too. Like you said, I travel. I'm, you travel, yeah. I'm from Wahala, so I'm an hour away. Yeah. So I tried to get out every couple of weeks at that time. And um, then COVID happened. And I was like, well, great. Yeah, that's a convenient excuse yeah. to not not show up for a lot of people. Well, a lot yeah. of people want to lean on that COVID excuse out of fear. Like, I have my job, you know. Well, my thing was more thing. like, and I wasn't, I was never scared about getting it. As my father at the time, like I said, he was recovering from a massive heart attack. Yeah. So if anything, I could just couldn't take that risk. You yeah. Know? And so I felt like selfish if I was to go do that. Oh no, for sure. Happen for sure. So um, yeah, I took a year off, and then once I got, I mean, once I got vaccinated, like once two weeks was mm -hmm. open, I went back and like they're talking about locking things down. I was like, yeah. I, I, it, you know, it's talking about that again right now, man. I know it's crazy. It's, dude, that's a cool story, though, dude. I think a lot of people have that, and uh, you know, they have that thing that they've wanted to try and they just haven't done it yet. And yeah. I wonder, you know, I think because um, we talk about stand up comedy, like that's our whole world. We're nerds about stand up and stuff. And I wonder how, because uh, I recommend people do stand up. Yeah, I'll tell them, and I kind of feel like maybe that's silly for me to recommend that, but I think it kind of can be like a universal. It, it is more universal than we think. Yeah. Because public speaking, I think, is mm -hmm. still the number one fear of the average person. And, oh, yeah. you know, forget about public speaking. I mean, stand-up is like public speaking elevated mm -hmm. to an even greater... Because there's the expectation of generating laughter involuntarily. Because I've never, like, spoke, every spoke at a meeting at work and one of them go, boo, boring. Oh, Get yeah. Oh, yeah. And there's not, like, a real measure of how you're doing. You can tell people are bored, but people expect to be bored at work meetings. But I always, so, anytime I hear somebody say that they've thought about doing it, I implore them to do it. I mean, Absolutely. I, well, and for that reason, what you were saying, if that life's well, short, if there's something that you want to do, go do it. Yeah. I mean, if there's any advice I could give anybody, yeah. I mean, I don't, if you have people around you that are supportive or people think it's silly or whatever, screw those people. Yeah. They don't have to live your life. There's something you I really think it's. Do. I think it's really uh, – I get profound with it and philosophical about yeah. it. But I, I think there's truly nothing better because you get the reflection of back of yourself in the audience members. Oh, like, yeah. You get a mirror held up to yourself about how you're perceived. And uh, if you're too egotistical, that'll come out. If you're, yeah. if you're not confident, that'll come out. If you're not being honest, that'll come out. If you're being – you know, disingenuous or mean, that'll come out. So like talk about, I mean, my dad, um, and I want to ask you about your marriage cause you're married, not anything 
in yeah, depth, no, but just yeah. about marriage. But my dad said when he got married, um, the key to a successful marriage, he said, was low expectations. But then he also said it was like having a mirror held up to himself of like every bad thing that he had done and wasn't really aware of. And that helped him become a better person. But it was also painful because my mom was pointing out things that he needed to change. But stand up, I feel like you get that mirror of, you know, mm. people reflecting back at you how you are. And you don't really know how you are until you go out and try the try the material. Oh, yeah. How your persona is coming across all of that. So if you want to become a better version of yourself and more self-aware, find out who you are. I don't think there's anything better than stand up. Well, it's a version of therapy too. To yeah. Go out there and talk about stuff and kind of, I mean, it's just, it's a great experience, but there, it, just like you said, you don't know how people will receive your comedy until you're standing in front of an audience. Mm -hmm. You could, I could have played the moment in my head a thousand times and never knew how it felt. I mean, I could have never pin that right. down because, and there's, and there's people I, seen that were super cocky yeah and then cockiness bombs dude dude 100%. yeah well there was this guy and he um and i'm not trying to call anybody out this is a very interesting situation i think i may have told you about it before but mm -hmm. we don't have to mention names we talk about it though. yeah but the guy um it was his first time when my first time and uh it was his first time too and i just got off stage and i was kind of riding that you know i was adrenaline high you know yeah. and i ran into him like into the bathroom in the bathroom or whatever and he was like hey good set and i said yes your first time too right and he was like yeah i'm about to go on i said yeah. good luck man i said honestly when you get up there everything kind of goes away the jitters and stuff so don't be worried just kind of stick you know and he was like well i'm i'm not worried I, i'm a dj <laughs> And I said, well, I'm a DJ too. I DJ weddings and stuff. Yeah. And I said, it's still, you know, it's still kind of nerve wracking. I said, honestly, just stick to your material and just rel trust in it. And he said, I, I don't have any material. I'm just going to go up there <laughs> and see what comes out, you know. Yeah. And I was like, good, good luck. luck. Good luck, bro. And he yeah. went up there and he said, uh, and you could tell there was a couple of things that he was trying, like he had tried to work on. And it was kind of funny. He was like, got up there and said, you know, a bit. I'm not going to say it because I don't feel comfortable saying somebody else's bit. Mm -hmm. But he says this thing, and at the end, and it gets a little laugh. But you could tell he had nowhere to go with it. He yeah. hadn't thought it about. He hadn't connected the dots. He hadn't thought it out completely. So he started spinning the wheels. Yeah. And I think you know more than anybody. I mean, you've done it so many times that once those wheels start spinning, sometimes everything starts to kind of fade. Yeah. If you start to panic, you start blocking yeah. yourself and stop, start blocking yeah. the jokes from coming in. Yeah, you're not comfortable enough to pause, yeah. collect yourself. And so he started trying trying to say stuff, and then he panicked, and he started going into crude humor. <laughs> yeah, so he bent over the stool and started simulating sex with a woman. <laughs> started acting like he was getting fucked, basically. I would have died. And I'm that. just sitting there, like, just like <laughs> watching him die. Just like, this is hard to watch. Yeah. And then he finally, in the point where it all, like, he started bringing a little bit back, was a point where he absolutely, it was like watching someone drown. Yeah. Right? And you finally see him just start to sink and accept that they're going <laughs> to die. And he, like, puts his hands down and puts the microphone down and just looks out the audience. <laughs> And then he just raises a microphone, a microphone back up, and he goes, "This is fucking hard." <laughs> and everybody starts dying out laughing. Yeah. He's like, "Is my time up? Like I've been up here forever. Like I'm dying." Yeah, yeah. And everybody's laughing because it's been it like was, two minutes <laughs> because it's been it was genuine, yeah. right? Oh like, yeah, you yeah. got those laughs because it was a genuine yeah. moment. Yeah. And just like you said to me when I was talking about like the last time I was on stage at the Comedy Zone, I I did the worst I've ever done. I didn't completely bomb, but they did not want to like me. But right. But the big thing about that is, is you, you the honest said moment got the laugh. Yeah. yeah you say acknowledge it, mm -hmm. you acknowledge know, and that's it. the best thing that I've learned watching comedians. Like you said, you said acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. When I sat there and looked out in the audience, like I said, this joke, yeah. I usually do. It gets a big laugh. Nobody yeah. wanted to laugh. I feel oh. like every joke that bombs, there's kind of a fork in the road. Like you can, it can get way worse or you can release the tension and it can get better. But if you just stay, yeah. And and just continue down what you were doing without acknowledging oh what God. happened. You're gonna go, oh, that's how they get catastrophic. See, what people I most people are not big enough assholes to like, you know, just continue to watch you suffer. They'll be like, okay, give the guy a bone. give the guy a break. But if you watch the person <laughs> you, of the set, like I told you, it's kind of funny to dissect it because 
when I got off stage, like I walked up to Jeff Thompson. I had him record. This was last set. week, right? Yes. Yeah, pretty serious. I walked up to Jeff Thompson and he said, Good set. And I said, The fuck it was. <laughs> he said, No, man, it really was a good set. They just weren't reacting for some reason. And I was trying to play it over my head, like, What did I do? Like, I did this these jokes exactly the same I always yeah. do them. And then when I got my car and it was a, just, it was very, pre, it was very clear in the first five seconds of listening that the first joke I start with was like aiming at someone. Yeah. It was making fun of someone. Yeah. And it was making fun of like, you know, like plastic surgery, yeah. um, you know? And I was like, I hadn't, I had not established enough of a rapport with the audience. Absolutely. I hadn't won them over enough to be an asshole yet. Absolutely. Right? So all they saw was some asshole. Yeah. Just taking shots. And then that was a funny thing. The next joke I went on to, I was kind of, con- I, I, you know, I acknowledged it. What I said is I looked out in the audience and nobody was laughing. And I said, is my dick out? Like, what the fuck is going on? And everybody started laughing because they yeah. realized that I knew this wasn't going well. Right. And then I went to my next joke and it didn't really get any laughs. And it was also kind of a crude joke. Yeah. Like it was a newer joke that I was trying. I was yeah. Like, fuck. And then I went on to the next joke, and it started. I started coming back up, yeah. and it was just teeter tottering the whole time. Yeah. And finally, like the way I ended it was not even with a smash. I didn't go like, "Ah, Brad, thank you very much." I was like, "Well, I did this. <laughs> Have yeah. a good night. Yeah. I, if you need me, I'll be drinking my sorrows away at the bar." Yeah. Like, but um, that's interesting funny. too. And the reason Jeff said it was a good set is because he knows you. So he yeah. didn't have you didn't have to win Jeff over. No, Jeff already knows you're a good guy because he knows you personally. But a random stranger, uh, you know, you have to instantly be likable and instantly be non-threatening yeah. to get into that. So yeah, dude, I totally agree, man. All of my bombing sets are like that too. Or I'm <laughs> not. I'm just. I'm more about what I want to get out of it than I am about making the audience experience something positive and. Um, well, and that was one thing, like, you were talking about that joke that you like so much, the funeral joke. Yeah. Uh, one time I did it, like, you said, has it ever not gone well for me? Uh-huh. And it, the one time I did it and I heard more of the, oh, than, than, than the laughing, the way I leaned into it, as I said, that wasn't even for you. Like, that was for me. And that yeah. got more of a laugh because yeah. it was just. And like like, I know it's I know it's effed up. I'm, I'm effed up. Yeah. And like you said, it's more, I would rather, and Ryan Rudman said something on your podcast that struck a chord with me. I, and it was very honest. I liked what he said. He said, I couldn't go do clean comedy because I want to be, he was talking about being true for to himself. He wants to do something for him. He won't, he doesn't do it just because it gets a laugh. He does it because he thinks it's funny. Right. And that's what I, I would rather do something that I, a joke I believe in yeah. than like, you know, and I, and I'm not totally against doing clean comedy. I think it's a good challenge. I actually do want to do that. I thought about going tomorrow to Tom's. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, that'll I be a like fun show. That out. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, like you said, it's very, uh, Stand up comedy is a is a odd beast. Yeah, to, dude. To tackle sometimes. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's torture, but it's so fun. It's so rewarding. Oh God, it like, is. do you still like when you go up on stage? Do you still like? Uh, do you get nervous before? Do you kind of like have a little extra anxiety during your day when you know you have a set coming up? So, it's gotten to now. I start to get nervous like within the hour of going. Right, okay. like when I start when I start my trip toward Greenville. Like I said, I got an hour. I listen to music. I listen to like it's very corny, but I listen to like pump up music. Yeah, like, heck yeah, dude, I like, do that. Like happy, you know, stuff that gets me going. Yeah, I mean, it really does get those door. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna fuck this up. Let's yeah, do it. Let's yeah. do this. And then uh, before I get up, I kind of you know I'll kind of pace around for a second and I'll walk around and get ready to go up. And with, I always like have a, like a mini panic attack. Like right I'm not bef- going to be able right before, every time right I have before. A, yeah, yeah. I always think I'm not going to be able to talk when I get up there. Yeah. Even like now, like just coming here, I had a little bit of the thing like. I did too. Know, I did too. Yeah. It's funny how, and some of the comedians that we, we do comedy with, you would never guess that about. And every Correct. time that I brought that up to them, they said, every time. I feel the same as you. Yeah. For years, like there's yeah. comedians that's been doing this forever. It still feel like that, and I guess that's where you know that that's kind of like the you know the feeling alive thing, though. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, like if you didn't feel that, I don't think you would feel as much of a rush when you pull it off, right? Right, like yeah. so that's half the battle. Yeah, I mean that's the thing about the repetition of it too. It's almost like every comic that gets up for the first time, like that's the biggest step, doing it once. But even after you do it. 
like that step of doing it never goes away. It's like mm. a mini version of your first time every time you go up. So you never get over that. It's never like routine um, because you could always bomb. Have you got heckled yet? Yes. You have. I'd say I uh, haven't quite yet. I mean, how you define heckle is interesting. The worst I ever got, I've told it on the podcast before, was uh, I was I was like a month in and I had no business doing this. I went to a club in Atlanta that was an all-black comedy comedy club south of the airport. And uh, I did a patio show first, which is like a small show mm-hmm. outside of that club. And that set went fine. I was just goofy. I didn't know what I was doing. And then uh, I went on uh, the main stage, which was a comedy contest. And uh, the comedy contest in an all-black room, you know, they're, they black audiences are interesting because they – you they're less forgiving than a white or and less polite Ooh. necessarily. And I don't mean that in any negative way, oh, but no, it's just, no, no. just the energy is, is different, you know? Yeah. So like if you're, if you're talking about dumb shit or you're, you know, not funny, they're going to let you know. Yeah. And it's the weird heckles are like, um, like I remember I said, I was nervous. Mm-hmm. I said, yeah, I'm, a, I'm not gonna lie. I'm a little nervous. Like, I don't know if you guys noticed, but I'm like, you know, like, and People started to laugh at that, but I said I was a little nervous. Then somebody from the back said, you better be. And I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> so I was like, oh, God, let me just get through this joke. Oh, my God. And then the way the booze and tackle started happening, it was, it's kind of like a, a groan. Like Mike Epps actually did a good description of it because it's I think mm. it's common how it happens. But it starts to be like, uh, it's not even a boo. It's like a groan. It's like, yeah. uh, boo, boo, boo. And then it like builds and it like starts in. And then you're like, shit. Oh, my God. And then I got off stage, and then uh, the host roasted me for, like, three minutes. <sighs> and just, he did this white guy impression. That was so funny. <laughs> He's like, this guy is so pissed. He's like, you can't talk to me. My daddy's a senator. He'll buy and sell this building tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's that so great. It's so terrible. Yeah, yeah. I would be like, well, this fucking sucks. Yeah, dude. So. Oh. Well, it's good. It's good though. It builds character. I stayed there. The people were really nice too. <laughs> really nice. It wasn't like they were mad. Well, that's at me. it. Too. You gotta have a sense of humor. Yeah. Because like, people like, I, like I told you, I poked fun at that one guy. Like people are gonna poke fun at me. And yeah. That's, that's part of it. If you don't have thick skin, mm-hmm. if you can't go up, if you're gonna go up there and make jokes, especially some of the sick jokes I've made. Yeah. Then I, I, I I've got to take it right back. You know. Yeah. Like I have to. You know. Hell yeah. Have but you been heckled yet? I haven't been heckled. I, I don't think in the in the full sense of the word. Like I've had like people like try to talk, you know, like respond to me, mm-hmm. which is not necessarily heckling. Like I'd say something. Yeah, it's just being and just like disruptive. oh, you know, and just like talk a lot and like at me like we're having a conversation. Right. And I've kind of I've acknowledged it one time and kind of made a joke about it. Um while I was on stage, I was like, sir, I'm very happy you're invested in this. Like, yeah. we're in this together. Mm-hmm. And, like, that kind of thing. But um, I haven't had someone, like, maliciously happen yeah. yet. And I've seen I've seen it happen. And it's just, like, so, like it's just this, like, it's just this. Sometimes it's because the person in the audience wants to laugh, right? Yeah, they're, they want the attention on them. They want yeah. attention on them. And then sometimes it's just because they personally don't do not like what that person's saying them. I've seen a instance where a guy on stage was making Jesus jokes. Mm-hmm. And this guy behind me was like, boo, get off stage. You suck. Stop talking about Jesus. Can we get somebody else on stage? Like literally like out loud. Hey, get this guy off stage talking to people at the comedy club. And I'm just like, Who, where do you think you are? Like, what do you, right. what do you think you're doing right now? Like yeah. this, this is open mic night. This yeah. kid's trying something it is obviously not going well. Mm-hmm. Do you think he needs you being an asshole to him? You think no. that's going to be like, that's the other nice thing about comedy. If you try a joke that's offensive or inappropriate, the punishment is in the re- reaction. Mm-hmm. You don't need anybody else to heckle oh, you wow. or do anything. Yeah. Um. So yeah. And that guy really, I don't know. To me, that's, like you said, like, what did you expect? You're at a comedy club. It's on that guy to read the flyer. It didn't say clean show, you know? Well, the, it wasn't, and that's the kind of funny thing. That, and there's so many comedians that have pointed it out a lot better than I ever could. But there's so many people that are quick to laugh at messed up stuff that they think is funny mm-hmm. and then be super offended because they don't, the joke isn't catered to them. 
You know what I mean? Like they say a joke that personally offends them, and then all of a sudden they they found a line. Like mm-hmm. They didn't have a line before. But they have a line when it comes to something that actually offends them, and I don't. I don't. You're saying like that. somebody else says something. Like, like, uh, what was it? There was some comedian that was up on stage and making fun of, I think it was Daniel Taj, mm-hmm. and he was making fun of different, like, races or something. And then he said something, and somebody got offended. And he was like, oh, so you can laugh at me making fun of everybody else. Well, I said oh, something about you. Yeah. Now, now we found a moral high ground. Yeah. And that's the thing I don't quite, you know, if you're going to yeah. be, a, if you're going to be offended then just be offended by all of it and mm-hmm. then go away and let everybody else have a good time. Like, it's, you know, it's just, it's kind of funny. And it's yeah. funny to watch. People but, are way too sensitive. Oh, no. it's, it's bad. It's even getting cliche to talk about the offense uh, that people take. Oh, everybody talks. Every, about it. Yeah. But I think stand up's kind of important. You know, I think it's important to keep telling that edgy joke. You have to, Oh yeah, because it's like pushing back on the wave of. Well, once you apologize, like once you apologize, yeah. you have admitted that you've done something wrong. Yeah, do you know what I mean? So from then yeah. on out, if you ever do something that somebody thinks you did wrong, you have to apologize because you apologized that one time. You know what I mean? It's kind of this. Where's the, where's the line? You yeah. know, where, where do you draw it? It's funny. I, I think it's, it's definitely. Uh, <laughs> yeah it's definitely funny and i'm really waiting for like a crazy person to come to my show and just like just, just hey, roast just, you oh just roast me it's gonna happen yeah I, i'm the kind of guy that w- crazy people love me yeah. like I'm, I'm if i go within like 50 feet of a crazy person they find me really and they tell me their whole life story yeah like and this is not even the worst <laughs> one I'll, I'll start off with the most mild because it's the most recent i was at, getting a pizza at like a fair at a gas station it was one of those hunt brothers pizzas uh-huh. walked in and ordered it and there's this young guy behind the counter and I walked up, I was like, you know, he told me how much it was, and I was putting in my debit card, and he goes, my sister's wedding's today. Uh-huh. So, oh, that's nice. He goes, she uninvited me. <laughs> I said, oh, that's not nice. <laughs> he was like, yeah, I mean, I said, I'm sorry, man. And he was like, well, I mean, she just didn't like that what I said about her husband. Like, mom told me she didn't want me there. <laughs> I said, I, I hate that. dumps this on you as a Yeah, stand. like I'm standing there paying for my pizza, and I'm starting to like look for cameras. Because this guy's just, just unleashed, and like you see his whole demeanor change. He's like, just mom told me she don't want me there. What is it I'm about those people? I, There's something psychologically wrong. I think I think for that guy, I don't think he had anybody to talk to. Yeah. I think his mom, yeah. I think he had a personal issue that was going on. And I think... And this is something and like this sounds kind of full of myself, but I think I give off that impression that I'm an open kind of person. I'm approachable. Yeah, you're warm and approachable. Yeah. And usually that's usually how it happens. And I, and I joke about it right now, but honestly, if that guy wanted to sit outside and talk for an hour, I would have. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because people like that, sometimes somebody just needs somebody to talk to. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, we take for granted that we have people close to us that we can call no matter what, one o'clock in yeah. the morning. And some people don't have that, so they're stuck with that in their head. Yeah, yeah maybe there's around. maybe there's not something wrong. Maybe that was too cynical. Of me. No, no, there are now. There are different now. There's different now. I've had there's some people. There's a guy with like a top hat, and he turned around to me and he started talking. He I couldn't understand a word he was saying. <laughs> I was somewhere in line for a bathroom. He was like, "Yeah, man," I said, Arr! and I was like, "Okay." I was like, yeah. like, "This is how I die." Like, yeah. But um, I was at the worst where I like stumbled into a situation. Um, with uh, a buddy of mine calls me and says, hey, man, you want to go to a lamb party? A what party? A lamb party. What's that? A lamb party back in the day was, uh, and I I think they still have them, but uh, it was like before like playing online was a big thing. Uh This is like everybody gather in a room and play Halo. So they'd hook into like the internet with LAN cables Uh and they'd be like four people on each Oh, a LAN party? A LAN party. Yeah, LAN. Okay. So he invites me to this LAN party. And I've been to one before, so I was like, hey, that sounds awesome. Let's go play some Halo. So we end up in the middle of bumfuck nowhere, down this big, big like, dirt driveway. Uh-huh. And we come to a single trailer in the middle of the woods. I'm not knocking on trailers. I grew up in a trailer. Yeah, this, but that, it's in the other. middle of the woods. That seems sketch. 
It's always a coin toss when you arrive at a single trailer yeah. sitting in the middle of nowhere because you're yeah. either going to like meet some cool like person that just likes to stay off the grid or this guy's got like meat hooks right, right, <laughs> right. in his trailer. And we get there and there's this young guy and he's sitting on a bed in the middle of the living room. Uh-huh. He has beds set up in the middle of the living room. He says, my mom's asleep in this room or something like that. And then like, I'm like, all right. And like, he's sitting on this bed playing and he doesn't really say anything. We go back in this room and some friends of ours are playing on this TV. And at some point, I end up in the living room on that bed. <laughs> like sitting. With, with the mom? With No, not with. No, it was him sitting on the bed. Oh, the mom okay. was like in this back oh, room. I never saw her. Okay. So I'm sitting there. That would have been, that would have been a good evening. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so I'm sitting there and he has not said a word to me this whole time. He's sitting on like, the back of the bed. I'm like sitting on the edge of it next to his girlfriend. Uh-huh. And my buddy's playing with that guy. You know, he, he's sitting over here in this chair. You didn't know any of these guys? No. That's my buddy. <laughs> so, but I'm, I'm kind of the kind of person that would like talk to people. You know? Yeah. So me and this yeah. girl start talking. She seems very sweet, kind, docile. And somehow we start talking about hospitals. Uh-huh. And she says, yeah, you know, when I was in the hospital, um, da 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 And then she started saying like three months that she was in the hospital. And I was like, wow, what yeah. happened? Why were you in the hospital for three months? And she said, I was shot. Uh-huh. I said, who shot you? And that motherfucker went, boom. Her <laughs> boyfriend popped that hand up to me and went back to playing Halo. And I was like, I no longer feel safe anymore. Oh and I said, uh, and I started like panicking. And she goes, well, it was a misunderstanding. And he so t- like, it was really my fault. So he, <laughs> so he starts to tell me this story about, well, she was threatening to leave me. And I'm like, this is getting better and better. And he was like, and then she uh, was do. in the car and going to leave. And I was just kidding. I wasn't going to shoot her. But the gun accidentally went off and shot her through the stomach. So, oh I my took her, so I took her to the emergency room and ran in there with her body and was like, I shot her. Somebody help. And then she goes on to tell me, like, still, her demeanor has not changed. She's, like, bubbly, and she's like, yeah, you know, my family, like, they want me to press charges and everything, so I don't talk to them anymore. I got a restraining (laughs) order against them. They didn't want me to. And that's when, and I swear to God, this is the truth, David. You're not going to believe this, but I swear to God, right then, it clicked in my brain. Like, a couple months before this, some girl that a buddy of mine knew, my buddy Landon, was friends with this girl, and she brings her boyfriend over to my house I'd never met. And the guy was real mopey. And I asked him. We were outside smoking. And they went to go do something or something, and this guy's, like, left with me. And he just seems really, like, kind of going through something. I said, hey, man, you all right? And he goes, man, I'm just going through a lot of shit. My sister was shot by her boyfriend the other day. I swear to God, David. Is this an unrelated like, connection? Yes, thing? this is two months before I met this girl. This guy's telling me my sister was shot by her boyfriend, and she won't talk to any of the family. She's brainwashed, and she won't talk to any of us. Oh, and it was like, his sister. It was yes. his sister. Okay. And then two months after that, so I'm sitting here, and this girl's telling me the story, and the guy's sitting there going, I shot her. And as we're leaving, like, my buddy, who's so un- totally unaware, he was like, we're in the car, and my buddy goes, that was a fun evening, wasn't it? And I was like, did you not fucking hear any of that? And he yeah. was like, still a good time. I yeah. mean, he's like, you don't know what happened. You don't know both sides of the story. And I was like, he shot her. And he was like, I ah, don't bit so much. And he was like, Dude, Dude, that chick must have been brainwashed. Holy Dude, cow. It was, it was pretty crazy. Like, I've never, when he popped that hand yeah, up. Yeah, the fact like, the guy just admitted it. Yeah, me, I shot her. I shot her. He said it like, I'm. So, he's playing and he goes, I shot her. It goes back to play, and I was like, shit. You think Dude, if you gnarly. had good aim like that, you'd be better at Halo. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's yeah. terrible. We might probably use a shotgun. Huh? Was it a shotgun? Spray shot? You don't need a very good range shot. for that. You just <laughs> spray shot to your stomach. No, nah, I'm pretty sure Pick she would have been shrapnel. obliterated at that point. Yeah, like, could they wouldn't be. Have been there. Dang. Oh. But anyway, yeah, I just thought that was an interesting story. Of like, yeah, was that the dumpster fire story you're gonna tell? Huh? I was uh, gonna ask. Yeah, because I asked that that question. You know, what's the biggest dumpster fire story you have? Oh my god! Where everything know. went wrong. That's not really everything going wrong, but that's you know pretty. Well, crazy. everything. Th- there's two versions of that like everything going wrong. With, uh, that's like not funny. Is like I went through this period in my life where I was had a job and I was a temporary employee in a plant. I've been there for two and a half years. I was working my way through college. And 
within a week, I got laid off. My car broke down. I had to spend all the money on the car so I couldn't afford college. And it all oh happened within gosh. two weeks. And I remember me and my wa- uh, me and my wife then we weren't married. Um, she's my wife now, but we were uh, we weren't even we were engaged. And we were going down the road, and she was like poking at me, just giving me shit, like we were kind of like couples do. She was just giving me a hard time. Uh-huh. And like it's probably the softest moment. Like we got back to her house, like I was being soft, like I had all this shit going on, yeah. and I acted like I was so okay with everything, like I was gonna figure it out. I've been being like strong, you know. Not yeah. Really. And we got back to her house, and I was like, I'm going home. And she was like, why? And I was like, I'm a fucking failure. And she was like, what do you mean? I was like, I'm losing my job. I can't afford college, and my car broke down. I was yeah. like, I have nothing. Like, I can't. I, I was like, for the last three years, I've been trying to build something. And within a week, yeah. it all just got washed out under my feet. Yeah. And I was crying in her front. You, you cried? Yeah. Did oh, you, yeah. So you broke down, and then did you go home? No. You stayed? She well, I mean, that's why she's my wife. Yeah, I mean, she's amazing. I mean, she sat there. Dude. and she, what exactly happened? What did is, you? What did? What was her reaction when you started crying? She hugged me. She hugged yeah. me. She put her arms around me. Told me she loved me. Told she me understood. She, wasn't, she wasn't like deer in the headlights. Like she no. was thrown off by you. Well, we've been together at that point. We've been together for thirteen years. At that point, you had no. Now, now you we've have. been together at that point. Years. How long have you been together? At that point, two thousand and twelve. Uh. I mean, hell, I don't know. We've been together at least five, six years. Wow. So at least maybe seven. But um, yeah. and it was just, I mean, she comforted me and she told me, I mean, reassured, I mean, told me I wasn't a piece of shit. I mean, that's yeah. basically what it was. But the funniest thing about it is I started like, I was like, I was breaking down. Her brother had been with us, her little brother, and he walked inside. Uh-huh. Like we got him to watch a movie and I was like, acting like I was, was going to leave, you know, and, then she's like trying to come for me, and then I'm like snotting, yeah. and then she started gagging, and then I started gagging, and she threw up, and then I yeah. threw up. Her brother walked out, like we're both oh like gag- throwing up and crying. And he's like, "What happened?" Like, yeah, it's like an episode of Community when he comes back in. I haven't with seen P- Community. You've never seen Community? No, no. Oh, do you just hate good TV? Is that what's going on here? Like, next thing I'm gonna say, the office. Community's better than Big Bang Theory. You quote Seinfeld every time I listen to your podcast. You're quote. In Seinfeld, but you can't <laughs> watch Community. You oh watch community. yeah, I will. But um, yeah, that was but like that, the biggest. Well, okay. dude, that's that's a great story, man. I relate to it so much. I had a similar thing happen. Not, I mean, in scope, it might not have been as bad, but in my own head, it was. It was. Uh, it was two years into my current job at a medical device company, and uh, I wanted to do sales, mm-hmm. and nobody. It was hard to do sales because I was an analyst. I was just a nerdy yeah. analyst and nobody really thought I could do it. And uh, I had to fight so hard to even get an interview. And uh, I made it to like the final round of this interview. And um, against this other guy, I was performing pretty well. I got turned down for that. And the first time I got turned down, I just I got really pissed off. And uh, I just I was said, screw it. I'm going to interview again. And I went all in on this next job. And uh internal interviews by the way at the same company Hmm. and uh i had my whole heart was in it and uh the the second interview did not go well um and i had a suspicion that everything was crumbling like everything i built up in my head that i was gonna you know be my path and my future Mm -hmm. this company was gonna come to this and uh when he called me and and it was still kind of open ended on the phone and i tried to save it i tried to sell him i was like look and he said to me like even how you just said that, I don't know if you'll ever be a salesman. Oh, He's like, I don't know if you'll ever have it. Um, you know, I think you'd be a great ASR because I think associate sales reps, I think I, if somebody told you what to do, I think you could, you could do it. But I don't think you have it. I don't think you ever have it. And uh, he got off the phone with me. And I was like, similar to your your impression of not being able to afford college, like that was like my future is mm-hmm. is not certain anymore. And everything I had worked towards – and I I broke down and I involuntary tears as soon as he hung up the phone and basically shattered my whole identity. I was like, and it's funny. I was dating a girl at the time, and uh, uh, I really, she was a great girl. And uh, but that was the first time she had seen me break down, and uh, it was like, you know, she was she was supportive, um, but it it was like you said, involuntary crying, just complete devastation and it was like i was like rock bottom at that point in my own head 
Um, it was kind of funny. We went to a movie that night, and uh, there was this old guy in front of me who, like, I, I think I was on my phone or texting or something, and he yeah. said something like, uh, like, that's rude of you to be on your phone, you know what I mean? And I was like, don't come at me. I, like, lit into him. I was like, do not fuck with me, dude. You have no idea who you're talking to. Like, I am I am dangerous right now. I was like, he's like, oh, you think you're big? I was like, you want to do something? I will take you outside and fucking kill you. Like, you were imploding. I didn't say that, but I was so rock right bottom. And my er- uh, Erica, oh. my girlfriend at the time, was like, whoa. He was like, I kind of like that. You know, dangerous. But, oh, dude. It, to be in that place... I think it's, I don't know. I don't think it's all bad. You no, know? it's not. I think you it's... come out of it. You you hit bottom and you come out of it. Well, there's something. Okay, my buddy always. And I'll tell a short story that's kind of similar to get into yeah, the please. part I was going to say is um, after that, graduate college, all this. And at one point, there's something else that kind of happened where I graduated. I was using, working a good job, but it was also temporary and found out that I was getting denied for a home loan okay. because I was temporary. They couldn't take in any of my. I didn't know that at the time, but if you're like through a staffing company, they cannot Mm -hmm. take your income into consideration Mm -hmm. when going for a home loan. Anyway, some shit was happening like that, that and some other things. And I was on the phone with my buddy and I was like, I was kind of breaking down. And he said, well, first off, I mean, he's my, one of my best friends in the world, Joe Ferriola. Give him a shout out. Yeah. He said something I put in the speech at his wedding is what he said to me. It shows what kind of person he is. is he said, what are we going to do about it? Not what are you going to do about it? It's yeah. what are we going to do about it? Like, yeah. He was there with me. Hell yeah. And another thing, he quoted Rocky because he's Italian. He's yeah. from Connecticut. Yeah. And um, he quoted Rocky. And that's what I always kind of think about is when you get hit, it doesn't, it doesn't matter – how hard you hit it's how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward absolutely and it really is sometimes you have to have bad shit happen absolutely to you. And, and that's life what keeps life interesting is things not going your way if everything yeah. went every you know to plan all the mm-hmm. time it wouldn't be very interesting no you know and no. Uh, sometimes it happens for the best and it makes you stronger Oh, yeah. Makes you a better version of yourself. Oh, absolutely. I think if you play it safe, you're a bad version of yourself. And I think those moments, those vulnerable moments make us human. Those mm-hmm. moments where you're, you know, tore up and you just can't stand anymore. And one other thing just sits you off the edge. Oh, I've yeah. been there too, man. Yeah. yeah. I had a guy not make eye contact with me. I was going through a lot of shit. And he <laughs> kept giving me hell and kept giving me hell at work. Yeah. And he was telling me I was going to fuck something up. I was on like, they were doing like making a record on this machine, like setting a record on a machine or something. Mm-hmm. And I was involved in this. He kept saying, you're going to fuck this up. You're going to fuck this up. He was just being an asshole. And finally I turned around and said, why don't you shut the fuck up and do your own job and get the fuck out of my face? Yeah. And I just went off on him. And I'm usually a very personal guy. And I went, mm-hmm. but when I get mad, I go red. And that's yeah. kind of dangerous too. I kind of, uh, which I kind of, I really connect with what you said about yeah. that guy. Because when I hit that certain limit, there is no thought. You have to have that though. You have to. You, you have to have the capability of being dangerous. Well, I think you I've have pro- to. I've studied that issue a lot. I think you have to overflow sometimes. You can't keep everything in. It's not healthy. Yeah. At some point, you got to be a little bit of a psycho. Yeah. <laughs> it's, good. yeah. it's healthy. You know? Yeah. Like Because otherwise, you got repressed stuff that's really going to rear its head. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's I think, uh, yeah, I've heard a lot about that. We talked oh about it on Jalen's episode of the podcast. Yeah. But like, if you're always a pushover, you're not a good oh. person. That doesn't make you a good person. What makes you a good person is to be strong and, and brave up. and to be able to people to kind of know you have that strength and danger inside of you, but you just learn to control it and you don't use it. Trying to keep everybody happy doesn't make you a good person. Keeping the people happy that mean the most to you or that worth keeping happy, that's yeah. what, That's what's important. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I believe that. Yeah. Um, you were talking about like train wreck, so uh, I, I, that, that's all like one? sad and everything. Yeah, but this is like the funny one. Like okay. I wanted to start with, we went downhill. I wanted to take it up a little bit. Yeah, I always yeah, love sure. the story because it's like I have a bad habit of sticking my foot in my mouth. Yeah, definitely. yeah. And um, I was at my buddy I was talking about. I was at his house, and um, he had just moved into this house, and his girlfriend was there, which is his wife now, and her mom was there, and her mom's super Christian, super Christian. Uh-huh. And um, I always made jokes about, like, wanting to date her mom, like, even uh-huh. about around my wife. Like, but me and my wife wasn't even married at the time. We uh-huh. were, like, engaged. But it was just a k- funny joke, you uh-huh. know, and I would do that and kid around. And for some reason, my brain thought a joke was funny, uh-huh. and I didn't, like, 
It, what she said was we were washing dishes, me and my wife, and everybody's in this room, and she, the woman, finds a, uh, n- a nail on the floor. Uh-huh. Says, does anybody need a nail? And I said, no, but I sure could use a good screw. <laughs> and the whole room went silent. You talk about bombing? Yeah. Like, it went silent. And I just kept washing dishes, and I wouldn't make eye contact with my wife. Like, she's staring at me. I was like, You didn't apologize or say, oh, my God. Look at no. I just ate it. And then everybody left. Like, literally, like, she was, like, my buddy was like, well, we got to go to the storage unit for something. Yeah. And then that girl, a woman was like, well, I got to go here. And everybody cleared out. It was just me and my wife. And finally, well, how she did she looked, react? Caitlin looked at me and said, what the fuck were you thinking? I was like, I don't know. It sounded really funny in my head. Yeah. Like it was, and I don't know. I don't know what I was doing. She's like, you are an idiot. And oh I was my like, oh, yeah, I accept that. Like, yeah. I get it. That's great. I like your wife's reaction too. Oh yeah. She, so she, when did you've been married? Thir- or you've been with her 13 years, 13 years. Yeah. So how, when did you guys get married? 2016. Okay. So you've been married five no, two, years. 2015. 15, yeah, 15. So did you have a hard time getting down the aisle? And like, would you have any issue with the commitment or, or anxiety about that? Something me and a friend of mine used to always say is we said, we used to kid around in high school, but I really do believe this. I believe there's something called like the one, we used to call it the one year mark. And I've heard people call it the itch too. But basically I always found that like after being with somebody for a year, that's when you start getting that like panic. Of like, do I want to be with this person for the rest of my life? Right. Or do I, do I need to break up with him? Because we're mm-hmm. getting into long-term territory. So am I making this harder on myself? Do I need to? And then I sat there and to be, and this is a very, very honest thing that I'm saying here. It's absolutely what I felt. I, I evaluated. I mean, it sounds kind of like an asshole thing, but I went through my head like, do I want, am I stringing this girl along or do I really love her? Is right. this the person I want to be with the rest of my life? And then I did this scenario in my head of like, okay, let's say I, I break up with her now. Let's say I break up with Caitlin and I go and start dating around this, that, and the other, whatever, enjoy my youth, what, whatever you could consider doing after you break uh, break up with somebody after a long-term relationship you were 26 at this point huh how old were you at this point at this point this was a year into it oh wow this was a year into our relationship sure being together okay so i was 19 20 very young okay very mature thoughts you're having at this age and i was trying i mean i'd done i mean everybody that young has done asshole things i did some shitty stuff i treated her bad at some point 100 percent. yeah before that because we've been dating since like i said we were in high school i mean i was Mm -hmm. 18 years old so i was i was going through this whole thing i was like okay what what happens i date around this that and other and then when i want to settle down with someone what kind of person do i want to settle down with Mm -hmm. and i could not imagine a person that would be better for me for the rest of my life to spend the rest of my life with than her. Right. So why, why would I give that up to have whatever this misconception of like being young and going out and play, you know, being a, you know, playing around yeah. player, whatever. I mean, it, it wasn't, it just wasn't worth it for sure. me. And, and not, I'm not by no means knocking anybody that's single. I mean, I got a buddy that's, our age that's single, you're single. Yeah. As long all it comes down to is being happy. Yeah. And in my situation, I had found that person early on. I yeah. mean, I was very lucky. Yeah. Or unlucky, however you say it. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't wait it a couple more years. Like yeah. uh, no, I'm kidding. Um and I love her very much. We met in high school. Um, she actually was dating my best friend <laughs> for a year, a year and like yeah. five months she dated my best friend. Wow. And uh um, still friends with that guy? Yeah. Yeah, cool. We uh we weren't for a while. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not because of that. And he I mean he knows this. I actually had he made me tell the story to his fiance's parents the other day and I was like, Why? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, This is the most awkward story, but pretty much it was, you know, they dated, they were very bad to each other. Yeah. At the time where they dated, I dated this girl, we weren't good for each other, we fought. That girl dumped me. Um, I was single. My, uh, my buddy Matt broke up with her or Caitlin, my wife now mm-hmm. and um then me and him started he started dating this girl that was really bad for him and me and him started getting into it because he'd he had cheated on caitlin for one i wasn't okay with that because he was actually at my house when he did it oh, it was geez. a big thing like i had to watch this and i liked her i thought she was a very cool person right and i started kind of having feelings for her you know because mm-hmm. i had a class with her and that was kind of underlining it was like i would never 
done anything but like there was something there yeah and and then after they broke up me and her started becoming more friendly in class just friends right and me and him stopped talking because mm-hmm. we had fought at a party he got drunk right. and tried to hit somebody this is high school stuff like yeah no, like not... me and him ended up fighting at a party over unrelated like him just right. getting drunk out of his mind and then um you know, it was just a bad scene. And so me and her were closer. And then she came to this like Valentine's dance that I was volunteering at. Uh-huh. She volunteered. And that's kind of how it happened. We started, we walked around the track, started talking to each other and just started realizing we really liked each other. And then mm-hmm. I told her I was kind of had feelings for her. And she said she had the same. And I talked to him because I, I went up to him and said, listen, you know, I have feelings for this girl. Mm-hmm. And y'all aren't together, haven't been together for a while. And I want to mm-hmm. see what you feel about that. And he said he didn't give a shit. and Because mm-hmm. me and him didn't really talk anyway. And that's kind of how it happened. I wanted, me and her dated a little bit on and off. Stupid high school stuff, you know, yeah. and then, like, eventually I sat there and, like, we didn't talk for a while, and then I was, like, realized I loved her. I mean, yeah. And then I, you had that you time know, apart for you to realize kinda, that. Yeah. Kind of beg for her back kind of thing. Yeah. And then, uh, we've been together ever since. And yeah. Happy and, That's great, man. I, mean, I like yeah. asking questions like this because I'm, I'm trying to figure out, you know, uh, that whole thing. Well, it happens – it, it's different for everybody. Yeah. I feel like it kind of happens when it happens. And I mean, I would, I would rather if given the situation, I would rather wait a long time to meet that someone and yeah. everything happened right. And then get with someone other than the alternative of getting with someone when you're younger yeah. and marrying young and then finding out yeah. that it wasn't right. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of that. I mean, yeah, I, I, I talked about this before. I, I feel like I, uh, the version of myself at 19 or early 20, like I wouldn't have wanted anybody to marry that guy. That would have been a bad, cause I didn't know enough about who I was yet yeah. to be the right fit for that person oh, at my, all. My, I'm starting yeah. to try and figure that out. You know, um, it takes time. I mm-hmm. mean, it does. It, like, like I was just saying, I mean, my wife put in a lot of work for a long time. as when we were together to be patient with like, you. Oh yeah. yeah. Until I was like 20 something. I mean, I didn't have any ambition. It wasn't anything like I had pop dreams. I played music. I wanted to play in a band. I didn't have a job. I didn't have any ambition. Right. And it was one of those things where, like you said about your father, and mm-hmm. I, I, I respect that. What he said is absolutely true about it, having this relationship with someone to where you can be brutally honest and hurt their feelings and them know that the only reason that you would say the brutal honest truth is because it is the truth and mm-hmm. that you needed to know that so that you can repair whatever, you know, whatever's yeah. wrong with you or this, that, another. I'm not saying being mean somebody, just telling somebody, listen, this is something that you do that I don't think is healthy. Mm-hmm. And having a conversation about that without getting like, there's so many couple, like I'm lucky enough that me and my wife are very honest yeah. with each other. We can have a conversation, her say something that I don't necessarily want to hear, right. but I hear it. And we can have a conversation mm-hmm. about it instead of me getting defensive and being like, well, you go fuck yourself. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. it's not, that's a key communication. I hear that a lot. Oh, I mean, absolutely. I struggle with that. Cause I don't want to hurt people's feelings by saying what I really think. So I tend to put that stuff off. So, so yeah, that's, that's cancer in a relationship. Cause well, that'll just fester and grow. And, and then something will be wrong. Cause it goes unsaid. My, my dad says something all the time that my grandma used to say, apparently. And it's, uh, if it comes up, it might as well come out. Yeah. And I always, I, I love that because I think it's the truth. I think if you let something fester, if you don't bring it up, mm-hmm. I mean, there's a difference between letting it settle to the point where you don't say something out of anger. Cause you also mm-hmm. don't want to say anything you can't take back. Right. You know? Uh, but you want to be able to say it in a way that's not disrespectful and like mm-hmm. clearly thought out and kind of dissect it and then be able to put it in words that aren't going to absolutely decimate a person. But right. if it's something that you feel like you need to say, I mean, you need to be able to say that mm-hmm. without this person holding resentment against yeah. you for it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy. I mean, we have our fights like everybody else and we, you know, we joke around, we, uh, you know, kid around with each other. We bust each other's balls. She's got my sense of humor a little bit. Yeah, too, that's which good. Is good. Um, I don't think. Have I met her yet? Yeah, you met her once. Oh, I did meet her once. I'm an yeah, idiot. Yeah, it was a while ago. It's, Sorry, dude. I'm horrible at that. This too. is why I'm single. I'm an asshole. Dude, there's a friend of mine that uh, um, he had this fiance. He, I think, well, they were dating at the time, and so I was 
Me and him only hung out when we were up partying. Mm -hmm. when we were younger. I remember walking up to her and I was drinking. And I was like, hey, nice to meet you. I'm Brad. And she said, Brad, we have met three times. <laughs> and I said, was I drink? And was I drunk? And she said, yes. And I was like, and you're going to fucking hold that against me? Like, that yeah. was my fault? Yeah. Like, you didn't meet me. You met drunk Brad. Yeah. And yeah. he's kind of a dick. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's not yeah. my fault. I don't even drink anymore. I didn't even have that excuse. <laughs> so... Oh uh, my god! But uh, which way, Caitlin? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Caitlin. If she ever listens to this. <laughs> no, and she's awesome, and she's. <laughs> I mean, she lets me, and that's kind of. And like I was telling you, like finding the balance of going out and doing stand up, like and having a home life too is. Yeah, you got a like, kid. How many kids do you have? I have one. One. A one. A one, and I have a vasectomy. <laughs> no, well, I. It's the only one, unless you get it reversed. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> well, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I always make jokes. I had a woman at work one time, uh, this older woman, and she was like, you going to have any more kids? And I was like, no, not planning on it. She was like, God, thank you, Will. And I was like, I don't <laughs> think so. And she was like, you're going to have more. You can't just have, a, you're going to have more kids. I was right. like, I don't think I want any more. And she's like, I think you will. And I said, well, if we do, then I either have to sue a doctor, or have a very awkward situ uh, conversation with my wife because yeah. I had a vasectomy. Yeah. And then she looked at me like I was the dick. Yeah. Like, you're the one that pushed the, us into this territory, okay? Yeah. Don't act like I'm the asshole. Yeah. <laughs> Because you, you pushed us here, all right? Oh like, I thought that was funny. It's like the She's, woman who asked you if you were a believer. Thing. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I love that people will push you into a position of, like, stating something that is very awkward and then look at you like you're the asshole for, like, telling the truth or something like it's that. It's judgmental. Like, Oh, absolutely. I don't know. Which I have a dark sense of humor anyway. I've always, and like I told you, like the coping with stuff. So, like, yeah. there's sometimes where it depends on my mood. I won't hold back on it. I'll meet somebody for the first time and say something that just offends the shit out of somebody. Mm -hmm. And I'll think it's hilarious yeah. because of that. And then sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes I'll say something to offend somebody and I'm like, oh, man, I feel so bad about that. Yeah. Like, Gosh. Unfiltered. I like that. It's better. It's, um, it's more interesting, mm -hmm. definitely. I had a friend of mine that told me a story. Uh, we, me and him always talk about, we have a competition on who sticks their foot in their mouth. Right, right. And he, oh, man, he, fool, he won it. Because he was telling me that uh, he was working with this woman, and he hadn't he wor worked for, with her for years. Well, he hadn't seen her in two weeks. Uh -huh. So one day he sees her, and he goes, uh, so you've been slacking, you finally... Decided to come back to work and stop being a slacker. And she said, my husband died. <laughs> and he said, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. And she said, you signed the card with like tears in her eyes. <laughs> and he just like, I said, what did you do? And he was like, I walked away. <laughs> I ran away. There was no salvage in that relationship dude, anymore. That's so funny. Dodge. That's something. Oh, shit, dude. dude it that's was, something you or I would like, like not know. You didn't meet the person. You signed. You signed. The card. Oh my God! Oh. I did it one very similar. Uh, my dad had this friend. His name I won't say his name. <laughs> he had a friend and he died. Uh -huh. And very nice guy. And uh, he used to always. I remember going to dinner with the guy and the guy or lunch with the guy and the guy would always talk about how proud of his daughter he was. And like um, one day, you remember AIM? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I had AIM. And I didn't have any friends on it because I just got it. My buddy talked me into it. And he said, listen, copy my friends list. So uh -huh. I copied his friends list over my. Now I'm trying to figure out who everybody is. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking to this one girl. You know, I said, hey, my name's Brad. I'm just trying to figure out who everybody is on this. Yeah. I copied my buddy's friend list. She was like, my name is da 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 Um you're you're brad da, da, da. I, I knew your father my father worked with your father and she said that to you yeah and okay. i was like oh my god yeah i remember um he used to talk about you all the time and she said really what he used to say and i said he used to talk about how you were and i told her all the stories about how she she was proud of her being in school and playing an instrument and all these different things and then she texts and says that was my sister <laughs> And I said, like a sister that's like an achiever that she mm -hmm. was could never measure up to. Mm -hmm. and then oh I my said, god! He talked about you too. Well, I gotta go. Have a good night. <laughs> yeah. Click. Oh my god! And I gosh. was like, I just ruined this girl's like night. Yeah. It was such a fun. I was trying to be nice. No, you need people uh, like that though. Oh man. 
you need people like you to to like hit people between the eyes with honesty totally it's so bad that girl did not need to hear that <laughs> so, but um no it's it's just funny it's uh i look you know you look back at stuff like that and you laugh i mean stuff like that that you find interesting Heck later yeah. in life. They're good stories i'm watching the clock here we're at an hour and hour and a half almost oh. so we got to get headed to comedy zone here in a little bit okay. um i was gonna ask what was i gonna ask um You've given some good advice in the interview so far, oh, but I, I hope. I mean, what's what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Uh, um, you know, I've been thinking about this, uh, and and I'm very long winded anyway. So there's a couple I'd have to go with. First, one of the things I think of is what I told you before about the whole, uh, you know, uh, if it comes up, it might as well come out. Yeah, I always like that one. I think one of the uh, one that I always think about too, and this was like. I don't know. This doesn't really apply to me now, but I always think of it because it kind of like struck a chord with me when I was really young. Um, I remember being in eighth grade and a friend of mine's cousin used to come pick me up here in Mustang. And like, because she got her driver's license. She was older than us. Mm -hmm. So she picked him up. She came pick me up. That's how we met because he talked her into coming picking me up. So me and her became close and I was like had a big crush on her. Mm -hmm. Huge crush on her. Yeah. Her favorite song was uh, Pink is My Favorite Color by Aerosmith. Really? Like, yeah, she's an older girl. I was in eighth grade. I wore trench coats. London London Fog trench coats. Uh Oh, so fucking awkward. Yeah. And I remember talking to her on the phone. I don't know how. Like, we used to talk for hours at night. And I remember uh, something came up. Like I said, I was, like, this awkward kid and, like, so awkward with women. Like, uh-huh. I got turned down. Like, the worst time I ever got turned down, I was in seventh grade. And I asked this girl to the dance that was coming up. And uh, I had been working myself up to it. I was talking to the girl all day. And I asked uh-huh. her to dance. And she goes... Right as I said, will you go to the dance with me? She started laughing, and she turned to her friends and said, he actually asked me. He actually did it. Laughed in my face, oh got up, walked gosh. away. Right? So this is how, like, broken of a person. For the longest time, I couldn't talk to women. Right. right. Still was awkward through high school. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so she gave me, we were talking about, like, and this sounds so weird, but, like, something came up about, like, being with someone, like, intimately. Like, sex. Have sex. Yeah, yeah, like, losing my virginity or whatever. She asked me if I was a virgin, uh-huh. and I said no. And she said, I want to tell you something. She said, promise me you'll love the person. And she said, I'm not telling you you'll wait till marriage. Promise me you love them. You'll love them before you do that. Before you have sex with someone, yeah. like anyone. She weren't a virgin marriage at the time. whatever, but that you love them in some kind of capacity. And I promised her that. And it really kind of struck a chord with me. And all through high school and stuff like that, when there was situations where I could have, like, I waited until I was 17. Yeah. And it's not, some of that wasn't by choice. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, no, there was situations where I could have. And I thought to myself, like, do I really want to? Yeah. Because like, it really takes away from to? how special it is. Just, you know, it was just why. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, like, for the first time and stuff like that, why there was girls that I could have. And it would have been this terrible situation. Like they yeah. were not good people, or this that. No, that sounds terrible. But and that always just struck a chord with me. I always thought that was a good piece of advice. But uh, make, but make sure you love the person you yeah. sleep with. Well, lose it too. I mean, I'm lose not, I'm it not too. against. I'm not against. Listen, if I got dumped tomorrow, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> be, I'd be swinging it all over. No, I'm just kidding. I'm playing. I'm playing, honey. I'm yeah. so sorry. Don't beat me. Um. No, but no, I meant like lose your virginity too. I thought that yeah. was a really good piece of advice, especially when your hormones are going crazy and as awkward as I was, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Could really get me mess up and get somebody pregnant at that age would have been terrible. But I, that that was always good advice. But the best piece of advice I think that I always kind of live by is my grandpa used to say, and my dad says this all the time. It says my grandpa used to say, "Life's." Uh, what was it exactly? It was uh, if you don't take if you take life too seriously, you won't get out alive. And I always loved that because it was like you're not gonna get out alive anyway. Why are you gonna take everything so serious? Like you gotta have a sense of humor about things, yeah. and you gotta have fun. You gotta do what you want while you're here. And, uh, mm-hmm. um, I always loved that piece of advice. Yeah, definitely. That's great. That's a great yeah. note to kind of end on because I mean we talked about it at the beginning, life's too short. Life's too short to care about what other people think or to hold back. No, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, and you usually ask, and I wanted, I was prepared for this, so I'm going to go in with it. Uh, 
favorite comedians. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned but, a few. We don't have to. Yeah, go ahead. Who's your favorite comedian? I was comedian? just going to say, I don't have a favorite, but I, uh, the you know, you got the greats. Dave Chappelle, probably uh-huh. on the top of the list. Yeah. Uh, Joe Rogan. Uh, Louis you look Joe Rogan. Oh, love. I yeah, like I love Rogan. Lot. His stand-up kind of gets, uh, is almost secondary for most people because he's known for his podcast. But yeah, you like Rogan. I in got your top into five. his stand up before I got into his podcast. I yeah. thought that was I got into his stand up is really that, good, man. I remember oh, him on Fear Factor too. Yeah, dude. Uh, tell you the truth, before the first time I ever got on stage, I was watching. I watched the night before. I studied. Uh, not that I was trying to copy it. Just the mannerism, how confident he was. Mm-hmm. That's what I watched. The night before I went to sleep. Yeah. And the next day I was doing this stand up. I was watching his. Um, I forgot which one it was, but I always loved his. And uh, there's an underrated comedian you probably never heard of, Randy Feltface. I don't know. I think that guy Feltface. Feltface. He does a puppet. (laughs) The comedian is like you never see him. You just see a puppet above a table telling stories, Uh and And he's brilliant. It was such a gimmick, but it works with how dark his. I'll have to look this guy up. Yep, Randy Feltface. Okay. And uh, one that has like this, like a very close like a uh, very special place in my heart because like when i was younger like the first one comedian i discovered when i was like in high school was uh christopher titus okay did you ever hear him somebody else told me about him he was kelby i don't know christopher oh, he's, titus. Amazing. he's hilarious his early so i haven't even seen the last couple of specials he's done but it was called norman rockwell's bleeding was the special what, what is that about? It, the whole thing Norman is Rockwell? about his life. Like, okay. it was the first, I think it was one of his first specials. Was Rockwell the oil tycoon? I can't even, I can't remember. I think he was an artist. Was an artist. Of, maybe not. I might be completely asking on it, but that's the name of the special. Okay. Yeah. I can't this remember is, what just, it's. This uh, is blind leading the blind. We need somebody else to look shit up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, um, uh, it, it, I think it just. I, I grew up around like, you know, my dad's not, you know, is not an alcoholic anymore. He quit drinking when I was 12, but mm-hmm. I grew up around that. Like, mm-hmm. one of the jokes I do is I open with, like, I grew up around alcoholism. Yeah. But, um, and I did, and that's one one of the big things about his, he had a very tough life. Yeah. His dad was a raging alcoholic. His mother was schizophrenic. Mm-hmm. And uh, his whole, he's, just to be able to tell real stories that are so tragic and still find the humor in it, mm-hmm. just to, it really, that's something like I try to kind of implement into my comedy and something that yeah. really spoke to me around like, you know, because I was like a teenager when I discovered that. So it really mm-hmm. like, you know, kind of, it, it mirrored some of the stuff I went through. This is Christopher Titus. Of, yeah. Yeah. Some of the stuff I struggled with. So I, I thought that was really Awesome. Yeah, I like those name drops. Randy Feltface, Chris. I got to look up both of those. In, uh, yeah, Randy Feltface is, like I said, it's a gimmicky kind of thing. That's all right. But if you watch his whole, he's got a whole uh, special on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And it's just, he's hilarious. I, that's one of the few comedy specials lately that I've just cried laughing. Mm-hmm. Like, Tom Segura gets me too. Don't don't get me yeah. wrong. Tom Segura is hilarious. Yeah. Burt Kreischer, I think, I don't think his stand up's as funny. I agree. I saw him live and not had, I hadn't seen him from Adam before that. Yeah. So I was just a new crowd member. Everybody in the room, he was at Comedy Zone. Yeah, I saw that. And he was good. I like him. But it was like, I didn't get it as much because I didn't know him personally. I think his yeah. character is more carried through. Oh, like, some of his stuff him. is hilarious. But a lot, I shouldn't be criticizing him. I mean, he's whole obviously thing. huge. Yeah, but there, and that comes back to what we were talking about before. I mean, I think everybody connects with different comics differently because mm. of just style and substance and stuff like that. The reason I like him as a person, I love his podcast and stuff. I like hearing him tell stories, but some of the stuff he goes into, I don't connect with the same way. Like Tom Segura is a little bit sillier and goes on these just like nonsensical rants Mm -hmm. sometimes about random stuff. And um, it's just hilarious to watch. And yeah, like, and I think one person I'll get a lot of shit for saying, I don't get Kevin Hart. I don't think Kevin Hart's that funny. Me neither. And that's like you know i gave some a, bits i do really like oh yeah he's but I, got I, I some tried, bits i tried funny. to watch that new stand-up special he has that was during the pandemic and i was like eh. <laughs> well i don't know and well and that's like uh something i tried to watch during the pandemic that i cut off immediately and it may have been funny but pete davidson 
<laughs> I started it and Dude, immediately you watched, when have you said, watched the podcast, I saw trailer? where you you said uh, Pete Davidson's trash or something real quick, <laughs> and I thought that was funny because I generally like like him and stuff, and like I think he's kind of funny on Saturday Night Live, and that's the reason I wanted to watch it because I seen him do the roast and it was yeah. hilarious, right? Yeah. Some of his jokes. So I turned it on, and for the first ten minutes, he was punching down at Louis C.K. Just this is why I did it. Because I love Louis C.K. so much. And, and I was like, that's the only reason I said Pete Davidson sucks is because what? I love Louis. That was I my did thing. Not want, it's I, like he he took this opportunity to do his special to have a dick swinging competition with someone that there are, everyone's already kicking him. It's an easy target. And that's, you that's a like, dick move. That's like kicking America when they're down. Well, like exactly Louis C.K. is a monster. He's he, coming back. Well, listen, and that's exactly it. Even if you don't, and me and you've talked about this before, even, you know, I think, some, you know, I don't know everything I've heard. I don't think it was as bad as it was made out. With think, Louis, I think he's coming yeah. back. And, and, but I respect people's opinions that do not like what he did. Sure, and do not like. I don't him. like what he did. But I, you know, you there, can, there's a lot of stuff that people don't. It's like. just judgment, you know, and, and that's uh, exactly it. And it wasn't prosecutable, and uh, well, you know, everybody it was disturbing. Yes, but. yes, it's very disturbing. And everybody has their opinion, their right to their opinion about him, and not to like him, not to listen to him, this, that, and other. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't see the point in punching someone that everyone's already punching. Yeah. You know what I mean? If yeah. the, you know, if some guy's robbing an old lady, that's terrible. Beat his ass. Yeah. But when he's laying on the ground bleeding, I'm not going to come get one more kick. <laughs> like, ah, yeah. fuck you. <laughs> like that's how it seemed to yeah, me. He was punching sure. down because he got he was mad at Louis C.K. about something Louis C.K. said about him on Saturday Night Live, and just, I was like, which is petty. And know. that's exactly. I tried to make it through it, but he kept on with it, and I was like, I'm not listening to this. Like I yeah. turned it off. It just seemed real petty, like yeah. you said. But yeah. um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think Louis would ever do that on stage to well, somebody he else. He would. Who gives a shit? I mean, the guy. That, well, he, I don't think Louis. I mean, Louis knows comedy better. Like he knows that that's not what you do. No, he's so. Well, he made fun. He makes fun of himself. Like he might have the biggest ego in the world for all I know, but he doesn't punch down. Well, I think that that's one I mean, of the he's reasons. Savage, but and he, this is kind of like switching lanes. But I think it's one of the reasons that Eminem's Eminem's uh, like rap now, it doesn't hit as hard. It's trash. Like when he goes after people, yeah, he went after Trump on that. Uh, that was like that hack. Eminem built himself up so high to anything he does now is punching down. So it was in the beginning, it was awesome to hear him rapping about all these famous people because he was the odd man out. He was yeah. trying to build himself up, this, that, and other, but now it's just him punching down. Mm -hmm. And it's not as good as and it it's, was. And one it's way an easy punching bag. Like you said, everybody punches at Trump. So, like, that's, that's not new or yeah. fresh at all. Well, it's like if I went on stage tonight and started talking about Kramer from Seinfeld. Everybody's <laughs> like, isn't that a little outdated? Like, haven't yeah. we already covered that ground? Like, yeah. Who gives a shit? Yeah. Like, go, go for something else. Go for like something it's an easy blow. It might be yeah. true. I might be absolutely true in everything I say, but it's mm -hmm. a pretty easy blow. I mean, yeah, yeah. I think that's funny. So does that round out your comedians? Uh, I think so. I mean, yeah. I, I, I kind of talked about who I hated and who I liked, and uh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of good. Anthony Jeselnik is another one, dude. Right? I like him. I, that's one I don't know that, if I like him as a person. I don't know who he is, really. As a I've person. heard... I was watching a podcast. I'm not trying to make this thing go on extremely long, but um, watching him on a podcast, and they were talking about how nice of a guy he was. Yeah. And something they said that actually rings true, especially with everything that happened with Bill Cosby, they were talking about most of the clean comedians are actually the people that are assholes and yeah. stuff. They put on this persona and that most of the really dirty comedians, they're airing all their dirty laundry. Mm -hmm. Everything they have that's toxic is on the outside. Yeah. They're airing it. They're hopping it up. You know, they're pushing it in your face yeah. and they're actually really nice people. I almost feel like Jeselnik is different though because he isn't his honest self on stage. I mean, he goes edgy, but it's really a character he maintains. Tosh, similarly. I don't feel like I yeah. know a lot about Tosh or Jeselnik. Well, that's what I'm saying. Personally. I'm, I'm, I'm saying they, they, any bad thought they have. But the bad thoughts out. are, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's not like they're, they really are a piece of shit or doing bad yeah. stuff or like, like Anthony Jeselnik, something he said in this podcast I was watching is he said the reason he came up with the way he does things on stage, that character, like mm -hmm. you said, 
is because people did not want to like him. He just has a personality that's not likable. Yeah. And the okay. only way he yeah. could get a laugh is to lean into it. Yeah. So he noticed that if he tried to be like genuine stuff like that, nobody thought he was funny. But if he started leaning into I'm an asshole and I'm going to say asshole things, yeah. that people would laugh because yeah. it is just on the nose. It's just in Character. face careless. Yeah. 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 And um, I like that. That's one thing I try to like. If I try to be like any comedian that's one thing i try to take from is to have that confidence because some like you said some of my setups like i do this long drawn out thing and i twist at the end and say mm. some really like vulgar or yeah. kind of dark stuff and that's kind of not trying to be him but i've noticed that that's kind of the way i do that it's kind of adjacent yeah and i really admire the way he pulls it off for sure but not I, easy to do yeah no it's not well Definitely. we got to go to comedy zone here pretty quick yeah but uh, before we go, you got to promote your stuff. Um, you got a bunch of stuff. <laughs> Talk about your book, your TikTok, everything. Oh Where can people God. find um, you? The book is on Amazon. You can't get it uh, in, in paper or anything like that right now. It's only digital. I just haven't what's the what's the doing that. What's the book really The quick. book is called uh, How to Shave a Zebra. <laughs> um, I just wanted to write. I don't know. I, I've had, and I, I write a little bit. I mean, we didn't get a lot into that. I like to write stuff and. I have tried my hand at like writing uh, really long form things and it kind of gets to where I'm so busy where I can't really pull it off. And I had uh, written a couple of stuff like I have a daughter. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to write something just silly and something yeah. funny. And I wrote this thing in like a, like a couple minutes. It just kind of all poured out. I'll be like, how, what's the silliest? If I wrote, wrote a how to book, about this something you would never need to know how to do what would it be well how to shave a zebra <laughs> and it's this stupid little you know and i drew everything in it because i wanted to uh -huh. see if i could because i like drawing uh -huh. and uh i sat and drew the whole thing and uh it's on amazon uh kindle store for so it's, like it's for kids bucks. right it's not it's there's for kids. no edgy humor in it no okay no cool so humor. i could get this there, for my nieces some, yeah there's some funny okay. i think that's funny jokes and stuff like that but it's very short it's like a couple pay like six pages or something mm -hmm. and um cool. i'm looking into getting it on paper or having it printed up and having physical copies to sell i just haven't got there yet mm -hmm. um as far as anything else i have a youtube account uh brad deaton i don't post a lot on there anymore i tried to make some things go uh but I uh, haven't been on there a lot. TikTok, you'll find me on there every once in a while. I'll, TikTok, your TikToks are hilarious. Oh, thank you I was having so fun much. This, this morning looking at your TikTok. And I, I usually do a dump. That's usually how it is. Like, I'll have a couple ideas, and then one day I'll have enough time, and I'll go downstairs and film a bunch of stuff and put them out there. And I haven't done anything in a while that was really funny. I need to start. Mm -hmm. I would love to get some people together and, like, start, like, coming up with ideas, like, we, you know, we talked about that a while, man. Dude, I'd love to do we, it. We, It'd yeah, be funny. They I just do. have people to do it with. It's funnier when you're working off of somebody. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to do that, too. Yeah. Because if you're trying to make each other laugh, that's like, I mean, you could talk about Always Sunny in Philadelphia. The reason it's so funny is because they started with the intent of making each other laugh. Mm -hmm. And it's easier to do that with somebody. Um, but, yeah, TikTok, Brad Deaton Comedy. Um, Instagram, I post a good bit every night. You know, I'm on there. Uh posting a good bit usually when i have a show i'll post it on there or facebook facebook's brad deaton instagram brad deaton comedy um if you want to find my i'm just here to promote promote my only fans you can find me at only fans brad deaton <laughs> it's, just, it's just really close up grainy shots of my butthole yeah yeah um yeah. but uh no uh, that's everything <laughs> i i try to do a show at least once a week. Uh, anybody out there that's booking, I would love to do some feature gigs. I actually haven't featured yet, and I would love to do some. I got like 25 minutes of solid material. Please hit me up. Book him. He's please, funny. Please, God, please do it. Yeah. Feed my family. Please <laughs> feed my family. I have a starving guinea pig. <laughs> um, no, yeah, that's about everything. Dude, uh, I, I want to go ahead and promote your shit for a second. I've been listening to the podcast. <laughs> I'm like four episodes deep into it. Appreciate and it, man. I'm, I'm loving it, man. And the reason it took me so long is because I, I don't have really a drive to work or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So it took me a minute. Like me and my wife, when we went to – I was telling Jalen this. We went to Columbia, and we listened to the podcast the whole way there and back, yeah. three episodes. And she was loving it, too. Yeah. And it's just – you're doing such a good job with it. You're such a good host. You, you prompt the right questions. You prompt good stories. Stories, you know how to get things out. No, really, I think you need. No, uh, I appreciate deserve it. Deserve more praise on that. You're doing, <laughs> and I was very happy to come on. I was no, honored dude. that you invited me. No, I, I'm super happy to have you, and uh, that means a lot. So thank you, because you know, with 
with the podcast, I have so much anxiety about even doing it. And uh, every you week, should. it's like, you know, so to get those, it's like stand up. You know, you feel Dude, silly about doing stand up when you first start because you're yep. like, is this work? Like, it, it's actually funny because my buddy that I'm meeting at Comedy Zone tonight, mm-hmm. he uh, said, You're doing, I said, I couldn't meet up for lunch. I'm doing a podcast. I said, What podcast? I said, I did this and stuff, kill, killing myself. And he said, Yeah, I've been listening to it. <laughs> Which buddy? Uh, Landon. Do you, I, I don't think you met him. Was he that, there last Tuesday or no? No, no. You had, I don't think How did you he met find him. it? Because he came to the radio room the first night I met you. And okay. it was the first night you told me about the podcast. Yeah. And I actually was telling them. I was like, I came back to my buddies and I was like, yeah, I was talking to that guy. I said, he's got a podcast, man. I was like, I'd love to do that. <laughs> I was like, that's a pretty cool idea, you know? And he went and looked it up immediately, apparently. He's yeah. been listening to it. And he said, I'll have to look out for your episode. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Dude, I love it. That I makes hope this is all right. Man. I hope I didn't go too long winded. No, I, this I could is talk perfect. Forever. This is perfect. The only backstop we have is the mic so oh um, yeah yeah so yeah but yeah dude thanks for coming on dude. i definitely want to have you on again it was awesome dude yeah anytime so, so awesome thank y'all for listening. yeah thanks for tuning in we'll see y'all next time bye